the wagon you rest in shifts back and forth as the rutted road makes the wheels boot, move and bounce in unequal staccato. The unevenness of this road uh, as you move uh, southeast towards Nassau. It makes it so you can barely even think, let alone sleep. It's uncomfortable. All around you, dark wood, the smell of sweat from previous prisoners lingers and assaults your nostrils. It smells like what you imagine prison is probably going to be like. And as the wagon bounces, light ekes in through uh, bars that are kind of set up in the high rafters of this wagon, kind of like windows and on the back and on the sides. And the, the heat uh, that kind of filters through, you guys try and sit outside of the sunlight as it, it, it burns, it, it's so, so warm. It's like a miniature oven sitting back here. And you hear in front of you, in front of this wagon, uh, where the seat is for this, this wagon, this coach, this prison wagon, uh, two men chatting, your, your prisoners, your, uh, not your prisoners, your uh, guards, essentially, um, as they kind of chat and talk about, you know, whatever, uh, as you're resting back here. Um, Corey, Jack, what, what is Jack doing uh, in this predicament, this sudden twist of fortunes? So Jack's leaning back uh, against the cabin wall, kind of like knocking his body against it every now and then, trying to kind of decide if he can fight his way out of here. Um, he's feeling pretty angry, pretty upset, because he feels like he shouldn't be in here. He didn't do anything wrong, at least to his knowledge. And that's the thing, is to your knowledge, none of you have done anything wrong. And... As the long miles have gone by, <clears throat> each of you has slowly come to the realization that you were framed, that you've been set up to take the fall for something that you didn't do. Now, some of you, trained as reapers, understand that sometimes this happens when unnatural things are involved. Somebody has to take the fall to keep the rest of the public unawares. But as far as you're aware, this isn't one of those times. And August, as you're sitting, uh, this big, burly uh, prize fighter kind of slamming his back into the wall, hitting his head, uh, you can see the obvious frustration building up within him. Um, what are you doing? Uh, what are you thinking about this whole situation? Uh, he would just mumble, banging yourself against the wall is just going to tire you out. Sit down and think for a second, all right? Um, and he puts on like this kind of calm facade, but on the inside he's thinking, oh shit, I pissed off the wrong person. Who did I piss off? And he, he'd just like be running a mile a minute within his head, but... Externally, he's just placid. Yeah, that's you fine can... if you can okay. keep all calm and collected, but I'm not going to stand for this shit. Hey, I'm going to break out of here. You know that, right? He yells over to the guards. Uh, yeah, the two guards, uh, you hear them like stop talking, and uh, one of them kind of leans around. You see there's like, a, there's like a higher window, and there's like a slat that he slides across. And like peers down through the bars at you. Hey, get up down there. We've been told to take you to Nassau. You're going to go. Don't cause no trouble. Maybe you'll spend less time in prison. Maybe not. Hey, you know what? Whatever. Maybe I can uh, lend some of you that to uh, have a, a, an attack on the road and all of us get out of here. How's that sound? The two just look at each other and they start laughing. Um, you, knew, you know these two people. One of them is Bart. Uh, he is like the, def the, the, the sheriff's deputy. 
Uh, but you also know specifically that he's a Martell man. Um, he's been bought out just as the sheriff has. And sitting next to him is Carson, who is a, a Martell underling. Uh, he's like this big, burly thug of a dude who you've actually fought in the prize fight several times already. Uh, and he's kind of sitting there. He's got this big double barrel shotgun sitting across his lap. He's literally riding shotgun. Uh, that's what it's called. And as he's kind of like, he looks back and he just like grins. You see these teeth. And you can remember each one that you knocked out or each one that somebody else knocked out. And he kind of just like smiles at you. This like more gaping than toothy grin. What's his name again? Uh, there's Bart, who's the deputy, and Carson, who is his like riding shotgun, his aide. Who are you smiling at, Carson? You enjoy your pores for breakfast? That's the only thing you're going to be eating for a long time with teeth like that. The smile disappears immediately, and you see him, like, his finger, like, twitch on the shotgun uh, before, like, Bart kind of, like, gives him, like, a look, and he kind of just, like, lowers it back to his lap. And Carson oh, looks big back. man! <laughs> Carson looks back at you, uh, and you see... I mean, he, he has, like, a bald head. Uh, you see there are, like, multiple scars. Uh, one of his eyes is kind of lame from, like, a bad hit he took in one of the fights. Um, and he kind of, like, looks down at you. Uh, and he speaks, like, very, very simply. Like, this dude is not educated. Uh, all I know is if someone going to hang, it's going to be you. <laughs> and he kind of turns around and, like, looks back at the road. Uh, and, if like, I had a dollar for every time I heard about that. I'd have enough for a train out of this shithole. And he thinks he thinks he's terribly clever, but he's not. Like he totally isn't. Um, and he's kind of like he turns back to Bart and they shut the slat again. Um, and uh, you hear them start to talk again, whatever they were discussing before. Um, Eddie, uh, as you're kind of li listening to this whole conversation going on, this this exchange of words, this exchange of uh, of punchy wordy blows. Um, what are you doing? I mean, you were in. You were in the confidences of several of these big families. Uh, what are you thinking that happened? So you guys would be forgiven for thinking that being here is all part of Eddie's plan. He's sitting there with his head forward, his hat covering his eyes. And as these exchanges are happening, this grin has just come across his face uh, like this sort of twisted twisted grin, like this is all a bit of a big joke. Um, and as the guards uh, shut the slat again, and you, you, you boys are both still carrying on, he just says, you boys want to live to see another day. Maybe don't provoke your jailers. And he's just thinking over in his head where he knows these two, that he's also in the cell uh, where he knows them from um, and what the connections might be. He's, he's drawing these elaborate, um, you know, maps with the string pulled across in his mind as to all the connections that he's had and the families had with each other and these other two guys here and where he might have gone wrong with his own dealings to, to end up here. Uh, and so far he's drawing blanks. Yeah, as you kind of furiously, <clears throat> you know, think things over, uh, trying to, to draw any sort of conclusion, um, just as uncertain as the other two. Uh, the Romy perception checks, gentlemen. I fail, I'm assuming. What would you get? I haven't rolled. I just know I wouldn't notice. Oh, okay, that's fine. Depending on what it is. That's fine. Nine. Okay. <laughs> Two. Nice. Eighteen. Okay, cool. Yeah, Eddie, uh, your your calm demeanor has served you well in this moment. As as these two are bickering, uh, you're just listening. And uh you hear uh from the front of the of the you know the prison wagon, uh Bart and then Carson talking. And uh, you hear, and I think this is probably what, what draws your attention, is you hear the word, you hear uh, Ernest and Parker uh, come up, these, these two Martell brothers, the Dead Slinger brothers is what they're called. And as you kind of listen, uh, you hear them start talking about the, the Martells. 
Um, and uh, you hear, uh, you know, Bart kind of is talking to, to Carson, who kind of is just, you assume, probably nodding or saying something nonsensical. So, uh, did, did Ernest or, or Parker say what we're supposed to, how we're supposed to do this? Parker kind of like leans over. I mean, not Parker. Uh, you hear Carson saying uh, something along the lines of, nope, just there's supposed to be an accident of some kind. Uh, you hear uh, Bart kind of shifting in his seat, kind of uncomfortable, the, kind of the screech of wood as he's shifting. I don't know. I don't feel right about this. Something, Something's going down, and I hope, you know, them hardens getting real friendly with the loons. And you know the loons are the Crotons. Uh, they're kind of like one of the other big families, but they kind of really keep to themselves. Uh, they're called the loons because they're very quirky, enigmatic. Nobody really knows how to take them. Yeah, but, you know, the families, eh, there's no making sense of what they do. One treaty one, month, one week and another treaty the next, breaking one the third week and forming a new one on the fourth. Yeah, I guess. Um, and this kind of goes on for a bit as they're kind of talking back and forth. Uh, what do you do with this information? So as he as he hears them start to talk about this uh, and especially picks up the information that they likely uh, are intending to take us somewhere to kill us and make it look like an accident, um, if, if uh, Jack and August are still sort of bickering, um, He'll say, uh, shh, shh, hush yourselves, and sort of lean in and try and listen while he's just sort of gesturing to these two to keep it down so he can hear. Yeah, as, as you lean in, kind of putting your ear up close to the slat, being as quiet as possible so you don't make the wagon shake, uh, give me a dex um, a acrobatics uh, or a saving throw, whichever you prefer. Because uh, the wagon's like shifting quite a bit, that's why you were sitting. be 16 save okay cool and you stand up you know centering your feet and you're able to keep your balance and be very very quiet as you move up there's only like one little of like the wood beneath you uh but it does it's not enough to startle them obviously like they keep talking uh and now they're on a different topic now that you're kind of like they're standing up there you hear them um there have been like a string of disappearances like pretty constantly like over the course of like the past like year like maybe like two to three a month but like they're usually nobody nobody really usually cares People just assume that they're trying to make it north or south or anywhere, but as I hope. And you hear um, these two talking. Uh, Bart's kind of going on. The disappearance has got everyone on edge, especially the Martells now. Two of their own men gone, a recruit and an officer, huh? Man, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. They're calling out for blood. And you hear Carson kind of like grunt uh, in agreement. There will be war soon. And he kind of just like slowly just, you, you hear him kind of shifting in his seat and uh, you hear him pop the, the cylinders uh, of this shotgun open the barrels and kind of like, you hear him like doing this over as he's like opening and closing it, opening and closing it. Um, and Bart kind of uh, snaps the reins, like to kind of move the, the wagon a little bit faster. All I know, if another officer disappears, there's going to be blood and high hope. Lots of it. This looks about as good a place as any. Uh, you hear Carson kind of just like shrug and nod. Um, and he, you, the wagon kind of turns and you kind of go off the trail you see. Um, you kind of kind of like move and look to the window and you see that you're kind of moving uh, towards kind of this, this road that you guys were following. Uh, you kind of went uh, north to go south. You kind of were, were near the pit. Uh, this is big kind of open area in the canyon. Uh, this bridge has to pass over. Um, and they're kind of taking you up past there, uh, and you can see that you guys are approaching uh, the canyon at this point. Um, and that is where we're going to shift. Uh, as you're kind of glancing out of the window, uh, we're going to go back to a familiar scene. You're standing at a bridge, uh, Eddie. And uh, this area, <clears throat> this bridge is at a place called, I'm here to pull up the map. Uh, it's called the Gateway. Uh, and the gateway is this area kind of down uh, at, the, at the far south. You can see where the road kind of goes over the, over the, the, the canyon, the gorge. 
And this is where um, the water, when it comes through, it's it, the, the people who deliver it are stopped there, and then it's taken into the city. Uh, the families don't want any you know, other companies trying to take over, so they handle uh, distribution and everything. So you're kind of standing there, uh, looking at this bridge, you see this long train of uh, water wagons uh, coming towards you. They're like these big, uh, like a wagon that would have like supplies in the back of it, um, like, like almost like a, like a pioneer wagon without the tarp over the top. And so there's just this huge barrel kind of sitting on the back of it that you know is just filled with life-giving water. And so there's this long train of these water wagons kind of moving towards you. Um, and the first one is kind of stopped uh, at the edge of the bridge after crossing uh, right in front of the gateway. It's like almost medieval kind of. It's like a, there's like wooden palisades, these kind of like staked huge trees that kind of buried halfway into the ground uh, pointed on top uh, with like two gatehouses and almost like like almost like a literal portcullis, like kind of over the middle of this area, uh, over the road. Uh, and so you're expected to go out and speak with these people. Um, and they've kind of stopped and they're waiting for you. Yeah, Eddie gets the familiar um, instant dryness in his mouth. Uh, is used to, as, as many of the denizens of a high hope are, used to sort of living in a perpetual state of somewhat thirsty you know with a bit of a dry mouth because water has to be rationed so much because it's so goddamn expensive and so every time he's out here with this task and sees this convoy of just gallons and gallons of water uh he just longs for it to take a big to dunk his head into the back of one of the barrels and take a big drink so he uh as he always does suppresses um suppresses that urge and uh ignores once more the the dryness in his mouth uh brushes aside the, um, the side of his jacket, uh, exposing the handle of his pistol uh, and the handle of his bowie knife at, at the other side of his hip as he um, paces up. Afternoon. How many today? Uh, you see the, the, the driver uh, kind of look back over his shoulder, looking at about 20 barrels, should last you probably the month, maybe a month or two. Um, are, are you, you Eddie, the one I'm supposed to speak with? He's just surveying the, the convoy and the barrels, not looking at the man directly. Uh, yeah, that's me. I, um, well, uh, and you, you know, roll me, roll me a, a history check. You see a symbol on these, on these barrels in particular that you don't fully recognize. It's not the usual uh, distributor. It's not the usual company delivering the water today, um, which is odd. It usually never changes. Oh, okay. That's uh, 21 history. Okay, perfect. Uh, you know uh, that this company, um, you actually know the name of this company. It's the Owen Water Trading Company, uh, OWT, O-W-T. Um, this uh, company has actually been taking the force by storm. Like uh, the, I guess the, they are very efficient um, and people appreciate efficiency. And so they are, they've kind of been taking this, uh, oh my gosh, what is it called? Oh, whatever, this business by storm. Uh, people like using them. Uh, your old, uh, the old people who used to bring the water. Uh, let me hear and find the name. I have this prepared. Oof. The, the Northern Water Distributors. Um, they, you, they've been delivering to High Hope for like the past like 20 years, 30 years. So like saying that there's like a change, like this is kind of odd to you. Um, but the man kind of leans down out of his like seat offering you a hand. His name's Bo. He looks up at him now and um, takes his hand. Pleasure to meet you, Bo. Uh, so I, I got a manifesto on the order right here and he kind of like reaches down beneath the seat and pulls out like a piece of paper. Um, and he kind of offers it to you. Yeah, he would take it dutifully and um, and read over it with a scrutinizing eye. Um, so this would be the first time that he that Eddie has um, dealt with this particular distributor. Yes, because it hasn't changed okay. in like thirty years. So yeah. Oh, this is like the first one from this new mob. Okay, cool. Uh huh. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, he'd probably be pretty happy for the for the change. To be honest, I mean, he's pretty um, scrupulous in general. But um, you know, he would 
with the other company, he would, um, you know, to be going through the motions more or less. So I think he welcomes the opportunity to um, look things over and make sure there's um, nothing dodgy in the sort of manifesto or the, the contract that's, that he's looking over. Yeah, you've been, you've been trade uh, and how to read kind of this legal jargon, especially for like the manifestos and how to like look for like what might be uh, essentially like false information or like an, un, like a, like if it's been tampered with or anything. And I was just going to like look this over. Everything seems to check out. Like it looks good. It looks right. Uh, and you see uh, Nettie Preston's signature at the very bottom. Like this is, this is legit. Um, whatever has happened here. And as you kind of like flip through the pages, uh, like seeing where the barrel is supposed to be distributed, um, I want you to roll me a investigation check. That will be uh, 15. Yeah, you're, you're a little surprised because you see that um, the Croton, uh, I believe that's what they were called. Let me here and make sure. You see that the, oh my word, that the, where is it? Uh, yeah, you see that the Croton, uh, their barrel, they usually get like three barrels out of every shipment. Because they kind of like, they run like the inns for the most part, and they handle, uh, and a lot of people go to the inns for water. I mean, like when they run out of their ration. So, I mean, they usually get three barrels. They have been cut completely out of this. They're not getting any water out of this shipment. He would definitely... Um raise it with the guy and grill him, I suppose, um, it, it, even if this guy is just the messenger or deliverer. Um, yeah, as soon as he sees it. Yeah, so he's probably reading through it, sort of doing that thing where he's mumbling out loud to himself as he reads through, like, oh, gosh, gotcha. Martel, Jeff, Croton. Nope, no water for the Crotons? Bo kind of shrugs. And he looks the guy in the eye. Yeah, Bo shrugs. This is the manifesto we received. Uh, this is signed specifically by, uh, I believe, Preston, Preston's one in charge of water, right? She called, she sent a message specifically saying that the Crones were to receive no water this time. Uh, I, I, look, I don't, I don't deal with the specifics. I just deliver the water. Yeah, I think he he suppresses his urge to um, <laughs> go go verbally toe to toe with this guy about. Yeah, he he probably even starts like. So many of the people get their water from the inns, and he's just sort of thinking out loud and trails off and uh, looks back down again and taps uh, his finger on uh, Nettie Preston's signature at the bottom, the, the head of the, the Preston family, who sort of, he knows that control the water uh, in the town in the High Hope. So, all right, well, I'll be raising that myself, but go on through. He kind of just nods. Looks okay. Yeah, he just nods. He says, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, you've been quite helpful. Uh, where are we supposed to live with the Braros to? Uh, this is my first time coming through. Uh, you well, would it's know. Good to see you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Good to see you boys arrived uh, on time, even a little early. That's uh, a pleasant surprise. So I can, um, I can give you an escort if you like. He kind of just nods. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Thank you kindly. And he kind of like scoot over uh, on the bench, on the seat, um, offering you a space, a place to sit. Yeah, um, you're, I mean, this definitely strikes you by surprise, Eddie, that uh, the Crotons have been written out. Um, it'll probably require some more investigation of the manifesto at a later point to determine where those barrels are going. Um, because 20 is the usual shipment. Like, you get it month to month. So... 20 barrels is usually what you get, but the fact that, I mean, like you said, like, where are those three barrels going? So, um, mm. Eddie would actually pocket the manifesto, uh, using the sort of, oh, I'll give you a, I'll give you an escort, uh, as a sort of, um, something to distract him. And as he climbs on, he'll slip, try and slip it into his pocket unnoticed and, um, and yeah, try and hang on to it to look at later. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. For sure. Um, yeah, as you kind of climb up, the porthole is kind of like raised and the train begins to move again, uh, this wagon train, uh, across the bridge and into the territory of High Hope. Uh, we're going to shift uh, now to August. 
Um, August, you received uh, an important or a message, a runner kind of came to you and handed you a letter uh, from the Croatians requesting your immediate attendance uh, at the, what's what it's called, at the, uh, the White Barrel Inn, or uh, as many people call it, the uh, Croton Livery and Inn. All right, he'd, ha he'd head over there after he uh, finishes the cigarette. Yeah, so you finish um, and start making your way uh, towards the southern end of town. Uh, you know that the inn is kind of on the very edge, uh, right along the road, actually, where the water comes in. Um, so you usually get this delivery first. Um, as you kind of make your way uh, down, uh, you would see that, uh, I mean, the people of this town are just as sad and sorry as they were the day before. Um, you are kind of living uh, at the Croton's uh, request in the kind of like the nicer end of town. Uh, they take care of you because you help them. Uh, so, but as you make your way kind of further and further south, kind of you see, because it's kind of like up on a hill a little bit, like there's like a little bluff that kind of the city kind of goes up on top of. Uh, and at the very top is Fort Caldwell. Um, you know, that's where the Hardens live. And as you kind of like, move along this upper part of the hill, you can see in the distance the rat's den. And that's what the, uh, like kind of the people who live in higher society call it. It's actually, it's like a slum, actually. Like the people who live there live in poverty, like terrible poverty. Uh, they're barely able, they're getting more and more in debt um, as they just try and get water to survive. These are the poor blokes who came through this town uh, expecting to make it the rest of the way north or south and finding out that the water was too expensive for them here and got trapped here. Um, so you see kind of this like shanty town kind of in the distance, this terrible slum. Uh, the people, and it's the most populated part of town for sure. Um, the people moving about there um, in a state of decay, almost constant decay. It's just falling apart more and more every year. Um, but as you kind of make your way along the edge of the hill and kind of back down, um, reaching to the south, uh, you would see this large, large inn. Uh, it's like it's four, it's like four stories tall, four floors. Um, and there's like kind of a couple of buildings attached to it as well. Uh, and this is the um, Croton uh, Inn. Um, and as you approach, uh, you would see that the, there are a couple of people in windows um, kind of watching the place, making sure that nobody unwanted or that looks dangerous or is obviously from one of the other families approaches. Uh, you know that these are kind of like their thugs and protectors that they've hired on uh, who work for them. And uh, they would see you approaching and you'd, you'd hear shouting coming from inside the inn. And uh, one of the kind of like the main kind of like helper of the Crotons, uh, this man named, oh my word, uh, <clears throat> it's this guy named Arlo. Uh, he kind of steps out, uh, kind of looks at you and smiles. Ah, August, just the man that the Crotons wanted to see. I see you got the message. Yep. Yeah. What do you need? I'll take you to him. Come on. Uh, Arlo is kind of this like thin, uh, yet muscled kind of man. Uh, he is definitely not a thug or a brawler, but you could tell that he'd hold his own in a fight. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why he's in charge. Uh, you know that he used to be a peacekeeper, uh, but he left the peacekeeper organization, so he's an amazing shot. Um, and he he obviously shows the sign, signs that he knows his way around a battlefield or around, you know, a gun, like a, a duel or a, like a, a shootout, I guess it should be. Uh, he kind of walks constantly with this, like, bend to his knees. Like, he's ready to move in case something goes down. And his hand is kind of, like, never further than, like, a foot from his gun. Um, so he kind of, like, walk you into this inn. And the main entrance is, like, it's just basically a hallway that goes left and right. Left is where the guests go. Right is where uh, the Croton's men and, like, helpers go. So he kind of turns to the right and kind of takes you back to the right. And turns left of the stairs, taking you down to the basement. Uh, that nobody's allowed into unless requested to be there or one of the high-ranking officers. Uh, so you, you're actually there pretty frequently. I mean, you help quite a bit. Um, so he would kind of walk you down the stairs, uh, kind of turning left at the intersection and moving down further until, and it's definitely, it's, you could tell it gets colder and colder and colder because you kind of pass the first floor basement and go down one more um, until you're in, like, the Croton's, essentially their home. Like, this is where they stay. And uh, you see that there's kind of like a bunch of like lab equipment like everywhere. There's like beakers and vials and like all sorts of scientific, 
you know, doohickeys and items just all over the place. Just low, like the tables are loaded with them here. And at the same time, it's like a living place. Like there are couches and like stools and tables. You see there's like a half finished like bowl of soup or stew of some kind sitting next to a vial filled with like some sort of like green gray liquid. Like you're like, oh, that can't be safe. Um, essentially, like, that's what you pick out. And uh, you kind of go following Arlo uh, to the back. And he kind of pulls aside a curtain. And uh, there'd be kind of this, like, large room. You've only been here once before. And that was when you were making a delivery. And kind of standing in this room, uh, you see uh, Marley, I believe is what you call them. Yeah, you see Marley uh, kind of standing over a table. And he's kind of, like, scrubbed up almost. Like, he's wearing, like, plastics and, like, uh, clothing to keep, like, fluids off of him. And he's got, like, these, like, literally, like, he looks like a mad scientist. Uh, he's kind of standing over this, like, table in the center of the room, and uh, there's a corpse on it. Uh, and you know that all corpses are supposed to go to the mortician, uh, but this one obviously didn't. And uh, you know better than to say anything. And he's kind of, like, leaning over this body, like, working on it. Yes, who is it? And he kind of looks up, and he sees you. Ah, August, just the one I wanted to see. Come in, come in. One of me, sir. Yes, yes, uh, of course. The uh, the Vata train came through earlier today, and they did not leave the Vata, what they were supposed to give us. Um, I believe that this must, must have been a mistake, unless the Prestons are trying to make a move. And he kind of look up at you and give you a look, like, are you still faithful? And, like, he gives everybody this look, like, all the time. Yeah, August is still unfazed. It's like, oh, there's a body, all right. Got to go, like, rough up some people and find some water. Just another shit day. Yeah. And he, he kind of, like, sees that, like, okay, this is, like, expected. Like, this is, like, kind of what's going through your head. He's like, he not. Well, we need the water, as you are aware. I would like for you to go and visit the Prestons and find out why our water was not delivered. Can you do this for me, August? Right away, sir. And as you kind of, like, turn to leave, August, and you kind of, like, you turn around and, like, look at him, and you see that he'd kind of be, he'd be working on the body again. Uh, you see that he kind of, like, walks over to one of the far tables and comes back with, like, uh, a beaker that he's kind of, like, shaking up, and you see as, like, he shakes that the two kind of colors that were separate before kind of mingle, and it becomes, like, a, like a dark purple, almost as liquid. I like to think that the people that are higher and he kind of, like, stops in front of the body. Um, and he kind of, like, fiddles around inside of there, and he pulls up this plastic tube that he's kind of inserted into the heart. Oh, faithful to me. And he kind of tips the bottle, and you see the liquid kind of, like, start pouring into, like, a funnel that he's attached to the end of this, like, plastic tube. I judge people by their hearts and their actions. And he looks up at you. Please, do not betray me with your heart or your actions. I would hate to see you on this table next, August. I always honor my contracts. I'll be right Good. back with your water. That is expected. And he kind of just like looks down. You know you're dismissed as he goes back to the body. All right. He'd, yeah. uh, he'd head out, and once he's out of earshot of him and all his cronies, he'd just mutter to himself, crazy old bastard. Yeah, you, uh, as you're kind of walking out, um, this is kind of be before you have, obviously you're not going to say that in the presence of anyone who's like super loyal to them. But as you're kind of walking out, I want you to roll me a perception check. Um, 15. You would see kind of as you're walking out, as you're leaving, um, that there's like a kind of a set of like papers and your eyes kind of, your curious eyes glance over them. Uh, and a lot of it is gibberish. It makes no sense to you. Uh, but one thing does uh, stand out to you, and you would see that uh, essentially it looks like schematics for some sort of like an invention. You see that it looks uh, similar to... You, you've maybe once in your life seen a Gatling gun, maybe once. Uh, but you see that this one looks like, like streamlined, super improved. And you see that uh, there's kind of like a, a 
a signature uh, beneath it. You see that it's, it's kind of signed off on. Uh, to, it, it looks like a production manifesto of some kind um, that maybe the Pressens are going to start. I mean, not the Pressens, the, uh, oh my gosh, the Croans are going to start moving, start doing something big. Uh, they haven't done anything huge yet. Like, like I said, most people just kind of ignore them and expect them to keep being weird. But the fact that they're going to start producing weapons like this, uh, you see also beneath his signature is the signature of Ernest Martell. What does August think of this? Uh, he doesn't react. He just files it away. That's going to be useful for later. Um, in case people start showing up with a bunch of holes in them in the middle of the night. Uh, and more incentive not to fuck around with them. Yeah, so you finally make it outside um, and you start you know, heading towards the press. And there's a place uh, kind of in the far north. I'll pull up the uh, map again. Um, it's called the Watering Hole, and this is where uh, you can basically uh, speak with the Pressens. Uh, you can't really see that super well. It's basically directly parallel on the far edge of town from the fort, from Fort Caldwell. Um, you guys each have maps, but yeah, the Watering Hole is kind of this open space uh, to the far west of town, uh, middle far west of town. And so you start making your way there, um, kind of pondering whatever your thoughts are, uh, thinking about uh, essentially what, I mean, what, what could he have been implying? What could Mr. Uh, Croton have been suggesting uh, with the whole heart analogy? Um, and we're going to swap again. Uh, we are now inside of the Snake Bike Saloon. Um, within, uh, there's kind of this lowered area, kind of like the, the wooden floor is kind of raised at least like four, maybe five feet above a sandy pit um, it's kind of like 20, be 20 feet in diameter, uh, and standing inside of this pit on either side of this ring, this makeshift ring, are uh, Jack and another man, uh, Carson, actually, uh, from our opening scene. Uh, Carson is kind of like, where you see him wrapping his, uh, his knuckles in tape, kind of like cracking them as he kind of like stares you down. Um, and did you decide to go with the name uh, The Clockwork Brawler? Is that your... Uh, uh, yeah, we remember that. Okay. Um, do you, unless you have something different. Do you have a different name you want to use? No, that works. Okay. Yeah, you see kind of like standing, uh, like surrounding this edge of this pit are like a bunch of like different people, like a bunch of viewers. Uh, and they're all kind of like shouting and cheering. Like, <sighs> There's like ropes that have kind of like been like strung between these poles to keep them from falling in, uh, the people who are too drunk. Um and kind of as you kind of eye Carson, uh, you, you, there's like a, somebody standing at the edge of the pit kind of like yelling down, on my left, we have the clockwork Borala. And everyone just starts like shouting, like, yeah, yeah. and it's like, on my right, red dynamo. And everyone's like, yeah. And they're all, everyone's just like shouting, it's crazy. Uh, like, and this is settling a dispute uh, between two families, the Martell and the... Oh my gosh. Oh, the Martells and the Hardens. Uh, the Martells are the, the dead slingers, they're like the weapons manufacturers, and the Hardens run the local militia and the church. Uh, and so this is a dispute between the two. Who has hired you, Jack? Which of the two, the Martells or the Hardens? Um, probably the Martells. Okay. Since yeah. I've, I've fought in their arenas before, so I guess they would, they would probably have the money to pay me too. Yeah, so um, it, it's, it's a very, very strange uh, battle. Um, and you know, uh, so this dispute that's kind of going on here between the Martells and the Hardens is, uh, is over kind of like militia laws, like who has right to patrol what areas of the city? Because the Martells are kind of pushing in on the Hardens. They want to have more control over the streets at night, um, you know, kind of be the force of the city. Uh, but the Hardens don't want that. You know that like one of the few things that lets them control the city is that they own the militia. The militia is in their pocket. And so uh, you guys are kind of standing on either edge of this arena, kind of looking at each other, this makeshift arena. And it's, it's, you see that there's like some parts of the sand are like stained red uh, with blood from past fights. Um, they don't do a very good job of keeping it very clean. You even see like some teeth like lying in the sand. 
Like, this place is brutal. Um, and so you guys, you stand on opposite sides, uh, you facing down Carson, and uh, you hear a bing as somebody strikes one of the bells, and we're going to roll initiative. Oh, shit. Uh, don't be afraid of using your like uh, your brawling points and stuff. Yeah. You're gonna get them back at the end of this. So go uh, hard. Thirteen. Hard. Thirteen. Oh, Carson sucks. Okay, he got like a five. Yeah, you go first. You two, you two start moving towards each other in the middle of the ring, and you guys have your fists up. You guys are ready to brawl. Uh, two pugilists going at it. Your turn. All right. So. Uh... Yeah, Jack walks forward, and he's just, uh, just thinking to himself, got to make quick work of this, don't want to let it go on too long, uh, as he just lets out, like, a fury of uh, jabs. So let's see. 18, 20. Oh, that's right, the 20s. Oh, no, that's right, no, it's natural. Uh, and 10. So the first two jabs connect. Um, <laughs> dealing nine damage as he kind of just softens them up a little bit to create some space. Yeah, you you land uh, two swift, you land a swift jab on his chin and his head kind of like rocks back. He kind of shakes his head and kind of starts leaning forward to go at you again as your other fist kind of connects with his waist, like in, like uh, the side of his uh, his gut. And he kind of like, oh, and he kind of stumbles to the side, uh, catching himself barely before like standing to his full height and coming at you. And this dude's big, like he's taller than you are. Um, but your the quickness is working to your advantage. You obviously got the first hit in, uh, first blood as it would. Um, so he's gonna make uh, he's gonna make three attacks at you as well. Uh, three quick jabs. Uh, his first attack is a 14, which misses. You kind of duck under the blow. It kind of like moving straight past your head. Uh, the next attack comes, uh, and that's gonna be a 16 to hit. That hits you, right? Yeah, 16. And his last attack is a 25 to hit. So as you kind of like duck under the one blow, his other fist kind of comes up and connects to the bottom of your chin. You hear, you feel your neck snap back uh, and your head kind of reel as he hits you for, I believe it's a D4 damage at this point. Yeah, it's D4. Okay. As he hits you for four points with the first jab, uh, like upper step kind of hitting you in the bottom of the chin, and the second hit kind of coming around as you kind of recenter yourself and hitting you in the side of the face, uh, you feel your, your jaw rattle. Um, it snaps together. You pull your tongue back, actually. Uh, you would have bitten it if you, if you hadn't been able to do that. Uh, and the second jab hits you for uh, five more points of damage. Yeah, he, he's kind of smiling at this point, and he's kind of like, like, kind of like waving you in, like, come get some. Oh, man. All right, so... Uh, so... I throw both strikes out there. I get a nine and an eight. So he must have rattled me a little bit, and, and uh, Jack kind of misses his mark. Remember, you have a th oh wait, do you no, you have a third attack, don't you? Oh no, you uh, no level four. Oh, okay, okay, that's right. Yeah, you. Only I used I used machismo, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, okay. So he's um. Yeah, so he's going to use some machismo too right now. Um, and he's going to do three attacks again. Uh, and that is a, a 19, a 16, and a 13. So two hit. Mm -hmm. And on the first one, he's going to use a machismo to try and do a stunning strike on you. So give me a con save. Oh, yeah, I forgot that we have those. Oh, God. Uh, eight. That is, you're definitely stunned. Um, so his first hit hits you for seven points as it kind of clocks you um, in the same spot where his last hit punch, like his last punch hits you, right in the side of the face. You're rattled. You see stars. You're kind of like you sway. And uh, his next hit then is going to be a crit because when you're stunned, uh, you crit. So he's going to crit you. So 1d4 plus his modifier double. So that's going to be 10 points. But he is going to use the crit chart to spend some of those points. How much was the first hit? Uh, the first hit was for four, and the second hit was for was for ten. But he's gonna spend some points on the ten. Got it. He's gonna wind you, so he's gonna spend five points to wind you. Uh, so he punches you straight in the chest, like super hard. You feel your ribs crack a little bit, actually, and you have a minus two to all skill checks and attacks now until the end of his next turn. Okay. 
Oh, so you're right. stunned uh, until the end of your next turn. Now you have the minus two on the end of his turn, and he's going to come at you again to try and KO you. He's used all of his machismo, though, so he has no more machismo. Okay. All right. So that's going to be... Um, oh, man, that's terrible. Uh, Wait, don't I make a save in between? No, because you're, you're no longer stunned now. You're just stunned until the end uh, of your next turn. Oh, until his next turn. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah. So he got he got a 14, a 15, and a 17. So he hits you one time this time. Okay. And, oh, that's terrible. It's only for three. He kind of, he socks you in the gut again. Uh, you kind of, like, bend over. Um, and you get your, you get your, your wind back. You, you get your stride back. And now it's your turn. Okay. All right. We got to get, get some luck here. I really just rolled two ones. Yeah, you I can't hear you. Twice? Yes, I just I just rolled two now ones in a row. Ooh. Okay. Um, you are you're you're super off balance. Uh, you kind of slip, actually, in the sand, uh, and you fall to your knee. Um, and he is going to try and end this. Uh, he has two attacks. Oh my god. Oh my gosh! First attack is only a thirteen. He misses. Dude, second attack's worse. That's a twelve. Okay, he misses twice. He kind of like he's throwing punches at you. You drop down to your belly and roll out of the way. Uh, you're back up on your feet now. All right. Uh, so yeah, hopefully hit him with the rising uppercut. Uh, let's see, two sevens. So that's two twelves. Dude, that's a double miss again. <laughs> yeah, you you two are just like circling each other, just throwing jabs, and you, you kind of both just dodging them, just moving to the side. Okay. That's a two, so eight. I mean, no, seven. And a seven to so twelve. Dude, you guys are you guys are missing everything. People are starting to board. You hear them Perfect, like oh. fantastic. Uh eighteen. So that's gonna hit. Uh-huh. Uh seven damage. I'm gonna use a, a point to try and knock him out. Or to I guess to to stun, to stun him. You're going okay, you're going for the stun? Yeah, so he's gotta make the con save. Okay. Thirteen DC. His turn to fail, it looks like. He got a 12. Okay, all right. All right, let's go. He's, he's looking pretty woozy. Um, so that means everything, everything now is a crit automatically then, right? Yeah, everything that hits him until he's no longer okay. stunned is a crit. All right, so we got to go with the flurry of blows, finish him off. And you have an advantage, too, because he's stunned. Let's see. So 14, does that hit? 14 hits. Okay, 19. That's a crit. Okay, and then 20. Um, so then, I guess crit, crit on crit is still just normal crit, so let me... Uh, yeah, it's just normal crit. Alrighty. Oh, 8, 9, 10, 11 on the first hit. Wait, how'd you get 11? It's a crit, so it's two dice, four. No, crit, you roll your damage die, add your modifier, and then double in Providence. Roll your damage die, add it, and double. So it'd be a D4 plus three is seven, so 14. Okay, 14 points, okay. And do you want to spend okay. on the crit chart? Uh, no, just just lay it out there. Okay, 14. Next attack. Um, second attack is... Oh, that's right, I need to roll one. Uh, for eight damage. Eight, so eight and 14, 22? Yeah, 22. Last one's 10. All right, so 32 points of damage? Yeah. How do you knock this guy out? Uh, yeah, so Jack's down on his knee and kind of like dodges the way out of a strike and then sees his chance and just yells out, time's up! Ugh! Just hits him with the uppercut from the ground on his knee. Uh, to, to knock him out as he comes in for a strike. So, like, he's, like, trying to punch down on Jack and then counters him with the uppercut as he just falls into the sand. Yeah, uh, you see, like, two teeth go flying, like, out of this guy's mouth, like, like in opposite directions. Like, you split the you split the lane in bowling, and they just go, like, off to either side. And he kind of, like, stumbles backwards, catches himself on a knee, and then, like, stumbles and falls to the ground. Unconscious. Uh, you hear the announcer overhead shouting, 
Clockwork Brawlers done it again. And everyone's like, ah, and some people are like, oh. And uh, you see, you see, standing up in the crowd above you, as you're kind of like circling, you got your fist raised, you're looking at everybody. Uh, you see the sheriff kind of looking down at you, and he's got his arms crossed. And uh, he's looking directly at you, and you know that something is going on. Uh, yeah, so Jack would see him out of his eye and just think, like, well, shit, that ain't going to be good later. Uh, but he just kind of looks back to the crowd, and he's, like, too enamored with it, and he just throws his hands out, thumbs up in the air, you know, starts waving at people, kind of drinking it in. Yeah, a couple of people, like, lower their hands down into the ring, like, to help pull you up over the side. Um, and as you're kind of, as you get back up there, uh, you almost collapse, like you're on the edge, essentially, like you're, like, you, you can feel your jaw might be dislocated. Um, and, uh, like a bit of, like, kind of blood, like, trickles out of the side of your mouth from where you bit your cheek when he punched you. Um, but you kind of wipe it away, and you see, uh, the sheriff's kind of approaching you, people kind of moving out of the way. Uh, they can tell that he's here for a reason. That was a uh, quite the fight. Got somewhere we could talk, brawler. Uh, sure know it. I can hear you just fine right here. What you need? <sighs> got the crap, Jack. I know you got a, a changing room or something. Come on. And he kind of like, oh. like shrugs, like sh like. <laughs> okay. I don't Come know on. you like that, sir. And he's but, not uh, amused. If it's just a chat, and you promise. He's not, he's, not amused. he's not amused. He's looking at you like, come on. <laughs> All right, so Jack uh, Jack walks him back, I guess, to his room, uh, or the uh, the pre-fight room, and uh, goes in first, then turns around, kind of just shrugs, like, what you need? What can I help with? Jack, where were you last night? Uh, I mean, is that important? As he kind of thinks to himself, like, oh, yeah, fuck, I was at the brothel last night. <laughs> well, you know that there's actually no shame in that. Like, people go to the bordellos. Like, they, it's a thing. So. Now, you see, Sheriff, I got a reputation to keep up, so you can't be letting this slip out that I'm a, you know, I'm a weak-blooded man. But I was, uh, I was at the Dead Slinger brothel last night. Mitchell. And he kind of just like slowly nods. You got anyone that can uh, verify this? Yeah, Dolores, Candy, Susan, Sharice. They'll let you know. He kind of just like looks at you. <laughs> Look, Jack, I, I get it. You're a showman, okay? I understand that. But look, I have a witness here claiming that you and three others murdered somebody last night down in the rat den. Why the hell would I go down there, that fucking pigsty? He kind of, he kind of shrugs and uh, reaches uh, into like a, he's kind of got like this like, like a bag essentially, and he reaches inside of his like a his jacket and he kind of pulls out his bag, and um, the burlap sack he kind of turns it over on the table and out falls, um, what's a super sentimental item to Jack? Something that he would never go anywhere without. Oh man. Um. All right, so there is a uh, a burn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a uh, there's a key. It's the the key to the house that he grew up in, but it's uh it's been burned before, so like the metal's kind of like blackened. So you can tell because it has like a like kind of wavy blackened pattern on the key, and he would recognize it as the as the key to his house, like childhood house. Yeah, he'd kind of like turn this up, and you see it fall onto the table, um, next to uh, one. Other item, uh, Eddie. What is something sentimental to you? Deck of playing cards. Yeah, it kind of so always playing... carries Sorry. with him, well worn. Yeah. What, what is the back look like? What is the uh, the face of the card? The back of the card. 
uh, like a stylized um, ocean wave. Okay. Yeah, he kind of he drops these old like a deck. There's also a deck of like these old worn cards. You see, there's a bit of like kind of like sand, like stuff between the the cards. And he kind of like opens them up and like flips them out. You recognize these? You know who these are? Uh, you look at the cards and just uh, no, I have no idea who those are, but I recognize this. And he like picks up the key. I don't know. Someone must have took it out of my room while I was in a fight or something, or while I was with Sharice and Susan and. And uh, Candy and all them. And uh, he'd kind of like give you this level look and hold out a hand for the key. So I have to hold on to that. You know that, son. It's evidence. I mean, you know, no, I can't give this back to you. It's son, mine, you, right? Son, if you don't give it back to me, I have to take you in. Well, all right, if I mean, if it's gonna, if it's gonna keep me out of jail, I guess. So he would hand the key back. Well, I guess yeah. I'll be on my way then. And he'd kind of take it and he'd drop it back in the bag along with the cards. And uh, you'd see he's kind of like tapping his foot, like thinking. And he'd look back at you uh, and he'd say, Jack, don't leave town. If you do, you don't have to come after you. Hey, can't leave. Got the key to my house. Jack, you know what I mean? Look, I don't know what's going on. Who was even killed? And he would kind of like uh, reach down, um, like kind of like pull out like a pad of paper. A man named Wyatt Starr lives down in the den. You know him? Roll me uh, intelligence. Ooh, 18. Let's go. Yeah, you know him. Um, he is a man who bet against you in one of your fights, like, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, and very loudly so. He was very, very drunk. Um, but he was, uh, was shouting how you were going to lose, uh, to your opponent. And, uh, you know that, uh, how did, how did, how did that make, did, like, did that, like, wh how would that make your character feel? Does that, like, make him lose his cool? Did he talk to him after? What happened? Uh, I mean, people bet against him all the time, uh, so he wouldn't really get angry or upset about it. He would just... Uh, he did call out your heritage, by the way. Oh, shit. All right. So, uh, yeah, at the end of the fight, I can imagine if, if Jack won, that he would kind of look out in the crowd, then point at him and just, like, like, throw a couple, like, handguns towards him, and then, like, maybe a salute to finish it off. Kind of let him know, like, hey, fuck you, man, like... Yeah, uh, and you would remember that immediately as you say this, and you, now you know that it looks really, really bad. <laughs> Look, Sheriff yeah, Mitchell. Yeah, it's a heckler for Happy Gilmore, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he bet against me, he lost his money, that was the end of that. You know, I wouldn't have no reason to kill the man. But, uh, you know, shit happens in the rat den all the time. Some guy probably stole my key thinking that he could extort me for it later rather than me kicking his ass and just lost it down there when he got an altercation. People die every day in that fuck hole. He would kind of like uh, slowly nod and he'd look at you. Look, I don't want to have to take you in. I'm pretty sure it wasn't you, but the description they gave, uncanny. Uh, and look, the, look, the big fucking be old guy that punches people. Yeah, there's look, not there's not too many of them around. Jack, I'm not accusing you of doing this. I'm just saying what the witness said. Who's look, the witness? It, I can't. Tell I got you that, rights, Jack. right? Jack, you know I can't tell you that. I mean, I'm gonna find out probably one way or another. Maybe. But, Jack, don't do anything about it if you do. Look, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why somebody would want to frame you. I don't know what you did to really piss someone off to make them do this. But, look, if I can't find anything suggesting that you didn't do this, I have to come for you in two days and take you in until 
until this can be sold. The hell? Now, look, I know these cards, okay? These cards belong to Eddie Morton. Maybe the two of you can figure this out. Maybe he's the one that fucking stole my key trying to extort me. Maybe. You go talk to him, then. I'm just letting you know in two so days. So you're going to tell me who is tied here? You ain't going to tell me who the witness is? <sighs> look, Jack. I can't tell you who the witness is because you'll act just like this with them and get yourself into more trouble. I mean, I do, I do sure have a way of working out answers in people. If you touch that man, now you know it's a man. If you touch mm. that man, I will have to throw, put you away in prison. Jack? Shit. Well, head over to the dead den and fucking talk to the girls. I'll tell you I was there. I ain't worried about this shit. I'm going to go talk to them. But you should start thinking about what you're going to do. You've got two days, Jack. Don't leave town, please. Don't make me come after you. I ain't worried. I didn't do nothing, Sheriff. Fuck. He nods. <laughs> All right. I'm just telling you how it is. And he kind of turn around and walk out of the room at that point. Fuck, man. I might be fucked. Shit <laughs> thinks to himself, like shit. Like he seemed very upset about that. Like maybe there's something else going on. But I don't know. At this point, he can't. Jack can't really do anything about it. Okay, we're gonna swap again to Eddie. Um, Eddie, uh, you guys uh, have pulled into town. You guys have gone to the watering hole, and they're unloading the barrels now. They kind of pull them down off the edge of the wagon onto this like little ramp. They kind of roll down. People are pushing against it so they don't, you know, just go tumbling off into the street. Um, but they're like kind of helping you take down these barrels and uh, they're rolling them down into the cellar for distribution later. Um, you would see uh, that kind of standing up in the upper window. There's like a, like a little courtyard surrounded by like four buildings. Uh, the main building uh, that kind of serves as like house and uh, an office to Nettie and like her direct family. Uh, you see, like, the there's, like, a big kind of, like, open, long window that kind of surveys the courtyard. And uh, standing there, uh, Nettie is kind of, like, has her hands on the window seal. Uh, she's an old, hawkish-looking woman. People call her the vulture uh, because she's, like, super shrewd in her business deals and very uh, no-nonsense. Um, like, if you don't pay your debts in time, you don't get your water ration. And if your family, you know, if they die from dehydration, then tough luck. Like, you made a deal with me, essentially. Um, she'd kind of be, like, looking down over the courtyard, uh, watching people as they come in, um, watching the water as it, like, watching each barrel as it's carefully moved into each cellar. You know that if a barrel's broken, it comes out of people's paychecks. You know the people who have made mistakes like that, like, broken a barrel, have ended up serving the Preston family forever. Like, her right-hand man is one of those people. And um, she's kind of watching um, very closely, and her eyes lock with you, and she sees you looking at her, and she her eyes kind of narrow, like, what do you want, essentially? So many questions are going through his head <laughs> as he's looking up at her. So many sort of schemes he's trying to figure out what must be happening, all of these threads that he holds, that Nettie holds, that all these damn families hold in this shithole of a town. And... Um, but uh, the eyes lock for only a moment, uh, and he just just nods um, politely to Nettie. Um, he's he knows not to trust her any more than she trusts him. Um, but in this instance, where he can't uh, speak with her directly, at least uh, um, there's no sense letting on that he may know that something's up. Um, so he just nods politely and and looks back. Um, you know, goes back to sort of. Uh, helping guide the, the people to get the things off of the wagons. As you kind of turn away, for, oh yeah, I noticed that too with you about at the same time. Uh, as you start to turn like to help again, uh, <clears throat> you see her turn to her side and like kind of like, like wave, like motion. And uh, stepping off from like the edge of the window, uh, this um, short uh, kind of, 
spindly looking man, uh, you know, more bone than muscle or sinew or of any kind, kind of steps out. This is the, the uh, her, uh, people call him like her lap dog. Uh, his name is Gideon. Uh, she kind of like calls Gideon over. You see them exchange like brief words and she kind of like points down at you. And uh, he kind of nods and turns, um, walking away, uh, making a good word for the stairs, you know, to come and fetch you. Um, yeah, she doesn't really miss like anything. Like her eyes are super, super discerning. So she knew you were acting weird uh, the moment you stared back at her. Um, so you know Gideon's coming for you, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's a smart dude. He would he would figure that out even if it was just out of the corner of his eye that he saw her sending him. Um, what would he do? Would he... I think, yeah, I think he sees it as an opportunity to maybe get some more information and sort of start figuring out what the hell's going on. Um, so he won't pretend that he's got other business to go away. And I mean, this is what they're paying him for to stay here until these are unloaded. So he'll just keep helping and um, wait, maybe position him himself so that when Gideon comes down, he sort of has um, like a position of more sort of authority, even if it's just standing on a wagon so he's physically higher. Yeah. Just a little yeah. something like that, yeah. Yeah, for sure. You can kind of step up onto the next wagon as you help them kind of uh, aim the barrel onto the ramp. And uh, you'd see Gideon kind of come out the door, um, like, the you know, on the ground floor. Uh, and the best way I can describe the way this guy looks, he looks like Grima Wormtongue uh, from Lord of the Rings. Like, he's got this nasty, greasy black hair. His skin is, like, too pale to be a providencer. Like, it's weird that he has such pale skin. Um, he has kind of this, like, seedy, oily look to him. And he kind of like make his way in this like shuffling half step. You know, one of his legs was lamed in that, in that barrel accident actually. Actually, and so he kind of makes his way towards you across this like sandy courtyard. And he kind of stop at the base of the wagon. Eddie, the mistress would like to see you now. Need to finish unloading first, Gideon. He says without um, breaking uh, what he's doing, helping people, doesn't stop to look at him. You do not keep the mistress waiting. You of all people know this, Eddie. <sighs> he stands up and stretches his arms out, oh, and cracks his neck, looks down uh, at Gideon right in the eyes, suppresses the, the sort of gag reflex that he, <laughs> that he has every time he looks at this slimy man. Um, they may, him and Gideon may have uh, sort of similar ways of operating at the root of it, um, but yeah, Eddie, Eddie does it a, a, a lot more, a uh, lot less seedily, I suppose, or he's just a lot less of a slimy man, at least on the surface. So um, he's always kind of looked down on, on Gideon um, and the way he operates, the lapdog that he is. Yeah. And he just, yeah, he would just shout over to the to the people he's been directing, offloading the stuff. Um, all right, you boys have got it from here. And he'll um, step down. Is Gideon um, a tall man? Like you said, he's quite wide. No, he's like he's like short and stooped. Uh, like like I said, one of his legs is lame, so he can't stand to his full height. Um, mm. But yeah, so he's like he's definitely a shorter individual, maybe like five foot, like three, five foot two. Like definitely very short. Yeah, Eddie. Eddie knows that any exchange he, that that Eddie has directly with um, Nettie Preston, the matriarch of the of this Preston family, uh, she always makes sure she has the upper hand. So he is sort of trying to at least have a bit of the upper hand with with her lapdog dog here, um, going into the situation to try and have a bit of um, yeah, not being already too far down in the authority side of things to fall even further. So yeah, he just um sort of make sure he stands pretty closely and towers over Gideon a little bit, um, non-threateningly, but just making his, his height known. Yeah. Uh, Gideon lead the would, way. Uh, yeah, he would, he would shuffle step in front of you, kind of, uh, like, for example, like, if you guys move 30 feet, have 30 feet of movement, he has, like, 22, like, because of his leg, uh, or 25, whatever. So he, like, moving at a speed slower than you, uh, than you would. Um, but I mean, you have to follow him. Like, uh, she sent him to get you, so you shouldn't lead. 
you know that that will just put you in a lot of trouble. Um, so he would kind of lead you uh, up into the house, um, kind of opening the door to let you pass him and go inside and uh, shut it behind you guys. Um, you see this kind of like this little salon, almost like a little waiting room. Um, and there's like a, like a family uh, kind of sitting in there. You see that the husband is very obviously missing. Uh, it's like a, uh, a woman and like three children, like two little boys and a girl. And they're kind of like sitting on this like very, you know, you know from first-hand experience, the couch is very uncomfortable. And they're sitting on this really uncomfortable couch. And the little boy, uh, she's kind of holding him in, his ar- in her arms. And she's, he's like crying like very loudly. And uh, you see Gideon like shoot them like a very dirty look. Like I like shut that child up. Um, before like making his way up the stairs, uh, you would roll. You would know them actually, uh, uh, Eddie. Uh, this is the the Ashcroft family. Uh, they are known uh, debtors uh, to Nettie uh, for water. Um, you know that they are in a very very bad situation. Uh, in fact, the husband comes in almost every month to try and work something out with her because. He can't afford to pay the debts that he's built up. Um, so you see that, like, she's kind of trying to shush the child, uh, kind of like bouncing him on her knee, uh, while the other two kind of like squabble over like a, a toy, like a little wooden horse that they're kind of like pulling at between them. And Gideon was started making his way up the stairs, uh, waiting for you to follow. Yeah, Eddie would. Um try and flash a, a reassuring smile as best he can to, to the mother and the kids. Um, yeah, just that for now uh, as, he, as he just continues following Gideon. Yeah, Gideon would lead you up uh, the stairs until um, you guys stop outside the large set of like double doors. Like it kind of, it goes up, it's almost like a grand staircase. Like I kind of, it goes up and then splits to either side. Uh, so it kind of leads you up the left side and then you go to the same place, but like, you know that to the right is kind of where her home is, where she lives, and to the left uh, is where she does business. So he leads you up the left side and stops in front of these large set of like beautiful double doors. Like controlling the water has obviously been good to the Preston family. They have a lot of property, they've got a lot of money, they've got a lot of influence. And uh, as you stop outside of these these double doors, uh, you see uh, Gideon just kind of like stands there quietly. Uh, you know that she must be in a meeting if the doors are closed. And uh, you hear desperate shouting. Uh, roll me a perception check. Actually, what's your passive perception? Passive perception is only 11. Okay. So you can choose to try and listen in if you want to. Um, it's up to you. Uh, I already rolled before you asked for passive, so uh, that'll be an 18. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you hear shouting on the other side of the door. Uh, just desperate pleas. Uh, and you know that this is Eric Ashcroft. Uh, this this man, the, you know, the husband to the, the wife downstairs, and he's kind of like, he's like begging her, like, Nettie, please, just, just give me a, a, another year. Uh, extend the loan. What, whatever you have to do, we can't survive without the water. We have no water. We need our ration. Please, Nettie. And you hear uh, somebody quietly speak. An 18 isn't enough to hear her. Uh, these doors are thick. Uh, but she says something back to him, and, he's, and you hear, like, it's quiet for a second. And you hear... If, if that's if that's what it takes, yes, yes, I I I will, yes. Just you you promise. Of course, yes, I know. You always keep your promises, and you kind of like. You hear somebody get to their feet. Uh, he was obviously kneeling or something, like begging. Of course, I I I will come. I will come back tomorrow. Yes. Okay, I thank you. You are generous. And the door opens, and uh, you see, as you kind of glance at the doors, it opens, you see Gideon smiling, uh, just this terrible, terrible grin, uh, this filthy grin on his face. Um, and as the doors open, it slips away, and uh, this desperate man, you see Eric Ashcroft kind of step out. You see his eyes are kind of like sunken, like he hasn't slept. His lips are just like chapped, like you know that this guy's on the verge of dehydration. Um, no, you would not still have your cards at this moment. Uh, you don't know where they are. You've lost them somehow. Um, and he kind of comes out. You see his head's like bowed. And he'd look up at you and you see, uh, you've seen this face before. Uh, you know that this man has essentially just sold his soul to the devil. Uh, and tomorrow they'll finalize the paperwork. Uh, he's probably going to be 
indentured uh, into the family to work off his debt. Uh, and his family will be provided for for as long as that happens. But you know it will be an endless cycle where he will never pay off the water he owes because he's always his funds, like what money he makes, is going to always go to worth providing water to his family. He will never make enough money to pay it off. It is too expensive. Yeah, Eddie's too familiar with this this cycle, uh, and this is just the way that the Prestons do business, um, and they're good at it. <laughs> and they've been way too good at it for years now. Uh, what decades it would be, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. If not generations. Generations for so, sure. So, yeah. So yeah, uh, as long as Eddie's uh, been alive and and known of of high hope and and uh, spent any time around here, he's, he's known that, and especially in recent years while he's been a bit more directly involved, um, but doesn't make it any less hard to see someone with that face coming out of that room with that, carrying that face, uh, and Eddie knowing that they've just, like he said, sold their soul to the devil, um, and his heart sinks for the man and his family downstairs, um, and, he bur and Eddie burns with a desire to, to as he has done in recent years, to, to do something to help try and break this cycle. Um, but he's not in a position to do anything about that just yet. He's got to keep doing his own bit under the thumb as he is um, until he can find a way to make a difference. So he just um, nods solemnly to the man as he, as he passes. Yeah, and he kind of like gives you a weak smile. Uh, you know that there's no soul in it. Uh... It's like when a smile doesn't reach your eyes. It, it, the smile doesn't even reach his lips, so it's plastered there like a piece of paint, like a piece of art, um, covering up essentially this horrible, horrible predicament that he's in now. Um, and he kind of moves past you, uh, shambling down the stairs. Um, you hear uh, the children kind of squeal in happiness as their father appears, and uh, you hear his, va his voice quivering. His parents would, I mean, like his children wouldn't notice. Uh, but you know that he's on the verge of tears. Uh, you know that he failed in whatever he was trying to do today. Um, so the door is open. It's held open for you. And Gideon steps inside, um, stepping to the side to allow you to enter as well. Yeah, Eddie would stride in um, confidently. Yeah. Uh, applying just enough, sorry, applying just enough meekness when he meets her gaze. Um, so as not to uh, raise her, you know, appear to be challenging her, but um, sort of quietly confident in himself. Yeah. Yeah, you, you hear um, the door shut behind you and you see uh, this woman, Nettie Preston, uh, the vulture, many call her, the crone, some, other call, some others call her. Um, one eye is blue and the other is green and they kind of like look at you uh, and there are stories about these eyes. People believe the reason why she's such a good businesswoman is because she's a witch and her blue eye uh, allows her to know if you're lying while her green eye tells you what your greatest weakness is. So she kind of stares at you, her fingers steepled, kind of covering her mouth, uh, tips touching the tip of her nose. And uh, she looks like a completely unassuming woman. She looks like she could be anybody's grandmother. And in fact, a lot of the people who are very close to her call her aunt, Aunt Nettie. Uh, but you know who this woman is after having served with her for how long? How many years have you been in the service of the Prestons? That'd be a good four years. Yeah. You know over the course of this four years how many lives she's destroyed. And you know how good she is at what she does. Like you stated earlier, it is almost as if she is the devil. Many people call her the daughter of Mephistopheles. Uh, this like rumored age old demon that people talk about, one of the best crossroads demons in history. Um, but you know that those don't exist. There's no such thing as a crossroads demon. It's just a children's story. Something that parents tell them not to make, tell their children so they don't make bad deals in their lives. But she kind of like watches you as you come in. And there, there's this brief, there's this long moment of intense silence where she says nothing, where she's just looking at you. And you feel like you're being picked apart piece by piece, like an anatomy puzzle. Uh, what are you thinking? What is Eddie thinking you're doing under this scrutiny? He always forgets about her blue and green eyes. Um, that might be some of the most prominent things that other people in High Hope think of when they think of her. Um, but he always 
forget it's one of those things where he always forgets about it until he sees it and then that's all he can think about the the stories about what her eyes mean what they can do what supernatural sort of abilities they apparently give her um and eddie's versed in um in the sort of supernatural spiritism side of things so he um he he's maybe still undecided i think um as to how many of those rumors are true and things like that so that's right that's right you were the reaper weren't you yeah yeah you, so, you know, um, that means you would know the mephistopheles is real right okay uh it's a well-known yeah, fact right. among so, the reapers yeah, that's... yeah the, the reapers have been oh, trying yeah, to nab yeah. mephistopheles for years oh man that's full on awesome okay so maybe that's what he's sort of undecided on every time he sees those eyes he's like oh uh, yeah is this actually the daughter of <laughs> the devil you know um she certainly the way she acts and the, how, how ruthless she is despite her surface appearance uh would certainly fit the bill so yeah that, that's what's sort of going through his head um he's a bit more distracted with that than the than he probably should be focused on the the underlying schemes and what might be about to happen to him you know he's a bit too distracted at the moment Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know that she delights in making people uncomfortable, making people feel uh, or experience the unexpected. So she would kind of like stare at you, you know, like I said, for this long silence. And then she'd kind of like wave, like you'd come and sit down in a chair right in front of her desk. You go over and sit down um, with a smile. I think I like to think. Um, the way that these two both sort of operate um they have that surface pleasantry uh always and uh you know it, it would be a rare occasion it would always be sort of veiled threats and and um things made plain under the surface um it would be a rare occasion where either of them sort of raise their voice to each other or things like that um so at least in past exchanges perhaps so yeah eddie comes in and sits down um half forces but uh it comes half naturally a smile um and he'd call it what would he call it like uh madam preston or something like that maybe yeah whatever you whatever you want to call it thing as far as you know she hasn't requested a specific title Mm. yeah he'd sit down with a smile and nod to her madam preston what can i do for you today Morton, it's always a pleasure to see you. And she kind of like gives you this like weird smile, like where it feels genuine, but you know that it probably isn't. Tell me, have you ever played Faro? Faro? Would I have? Sorry, out of character. Um, probably. Uh, if your character gambles, you have more than likely played Faro. Yeah, is it a card game or? Yeah, it's a card game. Absolutely then, yeah. Uh, oh. Well. I know it well, madam, it's one of my favorites. Good, perfect. I've been told that you know how to play Faro. Do you have a deck of cards on you by any chance? And he thinks to himself, that's quite an odd question. Um, he knows he doesn't. Because he know he knows damn well uh, when he when he has them and when he doesn't, he probably reached for them while he was in the hallway waiting. If he hadn't earlier, um, but he's probably known for a little while that he lost them while they were stolen at some point. But nonetheless, he sort of pats himself down, and looks looks in his pocket where they usually would be. Um, no, I'm afraid I left them at home. They can be a distraction while while I'm uh, working. Ah, oh, I see. Well, it's a truly a shame, but I have my own deck. It's okay. We can play with that one. And she kind of reached to the side and pull out this, like, uh, one of the drawers. You see that it's, uh, she pulled out this beautiful, uh, beautiful deck, like something you would never actually be able to afford. Uh, the cards are actually super high end. It's not just like really crappy paper. Um, and she kind of like pulls out this deck um, and kind of starts to shuffle them. And uh, you guys start playing Pharaoh. And um, in case, I mean, I, I, you probably know nothing about Pharaoh, but Pharaoh is like, it's a betting game. Uh, cards are placed out on the table, uh, and you bet upon the cards that you think are going to be pulled from the deck uh, by suit or by number. Um, and so essentially, uh, you guys are just basically playing this game. She's playing the dealer, you're playing the game. 
I really like the game Pharaoh. And this is just you guys conversing again. <clears throat> you know, I, I think of it as an opportunity for somebody to show just how far they're willing to go in their bet. She kind of starts setting out the cards. Uh, you see, uh, you set out like eight of them um, before you start placing bets. And I like to think of myself as very skilled at this game. And she's still placing out the cards. You see, I like to bet on people. How long will it take before they betray my trust? Before they earn my good graces? It's all a game to me. But I think I'm pretty good at reading people. And she keeps stealing out cards. What are you thinking at this point? One of the best that I've known, I must say, madam. She kind of looks up at you. Flattery and playing upon my ego will get you nowhere, Eddie Morton. And before she looks back at the cards and uh, finishes laying them out and looks up at you for He that. shrugs. The simple truth. Uh, but then just returns to, returns to the game. So yeah, you start placing um, bets and looking at these cards, and uh, she would kind of glance up at you. The sheriff came and visited me earlier today, and I must admit that I, I think I might have been wrong for once. <laughs> that seems unlikely. Well, you see, there was a murder. Several, actually, down in the rats then, but one had witnesses. And she's kind of like waiting for you expectantly to place that. And they found some items on the scene that was witnessed. Mm, fallen from pockets. Perhaps from the uh, pocket of a suit coat, and she looks at you. Regardless, it was a, a deck of cards. And an old burnt key. Tell me, um, Eddie, where were you last night? Why did you see fit to betray my trust by murdering a random individual in the street? Now, madam, last night I was working for yourself. I was preparing for the, for the delivery today. New distributor, much more paperwork and preparation to be done. Make sure things go smoothly so that you receive your uh, goods on time and uh, untampered. Are you sweating at this point? Um, I think he, she would definitely have picked it up, obviously. He's um, at points when she's sort of been dropping some of these things, he's hesitating more with his with his moves or his bets. Um, yeah, he's probably not physically sweating yet, but he's definitely starting to um, be visibly, uh, yeah, disrupted by what's going on, by the accusation as well. But he's mm -hmm. trying to play the hand of, um, come on now, it wasn't, you know, I was working for you, I'm, I'm here to help you, you know. Well, you see, like I said, I could have been wrong, but I don't believe that I was. And she'd look at you, and you realize at this point that that's a compliment. And she never gives compliments. Now listen very closely to me, Eddie. The sheriff made it very clear that you have two days before he comes to collect you. And she's looking at your best, preparing to draw the cards. Now, what does this mean for me? Well, if one of my men is out murdering people in the streets, this does not reflect well upon my business. The way I hear it, there were three other men who were supposedly with you when this happened. You're going to go with these men, and you're going to get to the bottom of this. And if you don't, I regret to inform you that I will have to let the law take you. Now, the sheriff has been kind enough to provide me with a name of the witness. And 
she would like look expectantly up at you to see what you have to say. I think he would, knowing that this morsel of very valuable information is about to come to him, he doesn't want to rock the boat or make the wrong move here. So I think he would just be uh, waiting intently um, and maybe, you know, give a subtle nod like, yes, the name. <clears throat> the name is Jasper Miller. Lives down in the den. You'll have to find him there. But the individuals who are apparently guilty with you are a man named August, August Boone. As far as I'm aware, he works for the Crotons. And Jack Grimshaw. The fourth was unseen, which is strange to me. Though he was described as wearing a large hat carrying several revolvers and bearing a badge. I am assuming probably one of the deputies of our dear sheriff. You will find them. You will enlist their aid. And you will use them to clear your name, whether it means taking them down so that they take the fall. or proving all of your innocence. Do I make myself clear? Morton. Crystal, as he places uh, his last bet or his last card, whatever it may be. Yeah, you place uh, you, the copper. Uh, the copper is like what card you think is gonna lose. So you're, you, you place the copper and uh, she flips the cards to show you what wins and what loses. And roll me a left eye, D8. Four. Okay, that's not unlucky. That's not lucky. Uh, so that means I'm going to roll one, too. And I got a seven. Uh, you win. And she smiles down at these cards and says, well, the fortune seemed to be smiling. And she would slide your bets across to you along with a little something extra. You've served me well, Eddie. I don't want to let you go if I don't have to. Right as you're about to respond. I'll continue to serve him. There's a knock mm. on the door. And uh, the door opens again. You see one of like the, the guards kind of like move to the side. And in comes August. And she would look up at you and like frown. The fortunes are interesting. What can I do for you, Mr. Boone? I'm here on behalf of the Crotons. You and I know why I'm here. I'm afraid I don't know what you mean. Throw me insight. <clears throat> uh, let's go and see here. Twelve, thirteen. She rolled terribly, so you know she knows exactly what you mean. You see, there's like a kind of a curve, a smile at the corner of her lip. Well, the new delivery boy missed one of his deliveries, so I'm here to pick up uh, our order, and I'll be right on my way. I brought my men with me. I'm afraid, doing the laboring. I'm afraid that the Hardens picked up the extra three barrels we had on this last order. Well, when do our three show up? Well, we can probably pull some out of storage... But that'll take Excellent. a while. And she kind of gives you this look. Ma'am, you know that I can't go back and empty handed. I always respect, I always uh, follow through on my contracts. You know that. I've worked for you before. People need their water. I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you one barrel now. A second barrel, when you agree to a set of terms that I have ready. And a third barrel, once you've accomplished those terms. 
Ma'am, I'm in no position to be doing deals on the Croton's behalf. I'd be happy to set up a meeting between you and Mr. and Mrs. Croton, and you can discuss the terms of the deal uh, on the next shipments. But fine, I Set need to meeting. pick up the delivery that was owed to us. That was ordered and paid for. Set up your meeting, fine. But as you kind of look at you, um, Eddie, uh, my friend here has some words to share with you. Uh, I think you'll probably be interested in knowing, because uh, apparently, Mr. August Boone, you are a murderer. And we'll take a break. <laughs> yeah, and he'd laugh at that, and then like she doesn't, she doesn't react in the same way. He's like, "Oh shit, what?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll take a break right there. Uh, ten minute break. Go get a drink. Go use the bathroom. Uh, be back here in ten minutes. Cool.
a four here too. And Corey's back yet. What do you think about the math scientist, uh, Dan? I like it. Croton, Mr. Croton, the German math scientist. Mr. At least, Croton. At least my terrible attempt at German accent. <laughs> I think it works, man. It worked well. The word well, good. I yeah, will yeah. judge you by your heart. Like, <laughs> Dude, all, all of these all of these uh, mob bosses and their their metaphors, man. We got the game of Far of Faro going on. We got the uh, <laughs> the whole medical anatomy dissection thing going on. Okay. It's beautiful. Dude, good stuff, man. You're really killing it. Sorry the first part of this took so long, but I had to, like, like come up with a good way to, like, pull you guys together, and this is the best I could come up with. Yeah, all good. No, it's, um, it's built up a lot of, like, tension and intrigue in that already, so it's good. It's loaded. All right, cool. Well, um, let's go ahead and do um, character intros. Uh, so go ahead and Tell us who your character is. Plug if anything you want to. If you have a channel, or if you have uh, just something that you believe in, like a good product or something. I don't know. It's up to you. Maybe Corey Biceps has like a gym membership that he would suggest. Uh, we'll start with Corey, and we'll go to Dan, and then we'll go to Keel. All right. Uh, my first recommendation is to stay away from LA Fitness. Their bathrooms are trash, and their gym equipment's always busted. Um, Planet Fitness and UFIT, they don't have uh, they don't have bench press usually, so that's a no go either. So you got to stick with like EOS or some other third hour party competitor. Um, besides that, I just play D and D with friends every now and then. That's uh, about all I got. Tell us about your character, my dude. Oh yeah, so I'm playing Jack Grimshaw, the Clockwork Brawler. He's a uh, Monk Three, Rogue One, Abomination. Because I only do those when I play D and D. Um, he's a stand-in for a normal Goliath character, which is what I would normally play, but apparently there's no enhanced strength race in Providence yet. Um, uh, let's see, prize fighter, womanizer. If all of you all watching are unaware, he is salty about this. So go ahead, continue, Corey. Yeah, uh, there needs to be more Goliaths in everybody's games, or Goliath likes, you know? You got all of these like elf likes and stuff. Just have a have a race of big burly dudes in there and burly women. Just saying, <laughs> equality. All right, I'm, I'm switching it over here because you're gonna keep going on forever if I let you, Dan. Hey, I'm Dan. I'm playing uh, August Boone. He's basically a no good, low down uh, thug, uh, but there's a little more to him. I don't have anything to suggest uh, other than to go to the YMCA. Uh, sometimes it's pretty good. They have a squat rack there, so it's not too bad. <laughs> You're terrible. Okay, go, Keel. <laughs> hey, y'all, I'm Keel. I won't even recommend any gym. Just go out and run in the open air, my friends. <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, sorry, Tyler. Um, I'm playing Eddie Morton. Uh, he is a rogue uh, hustler archetype, which is a really cool sort of charisma-based rogue that um, Tyler's come up with for the Providence setting, which I'm digging so far. Can't wait to pull out some of his uh, other abilities over these sessions. Um, yeah, really keen for this mini campaign and loving how it's going so far. Um, yeah, a couple more more relevant things about Eddie is that he's got um, some native Providence uh, heritage in his blood um, and he is trained as a reaper who are uh, like kind of I kind of see them this might Tyler might not like this but I kind of see them as like the the men in black <laughs> sort of unit how they deal with all of the um, supernatural stuff and protect people from this stuff that they shouldn't need to know about um, put themselves on the line to deal with all that kind of stuff and he's fallen in over the last few years with the Preston family who control the water in High Hope 
So it's just this nice, horrible, delicious mess. <laughs> Dude, now that you call them the men in black, that is totally the way I see them. Like, I see them as either <laughs> hunter, hunters from Supernatural or the men in black. That is perfect. Yes, I love it. Yeah, dude, they're they're the people. Dude, I totally forgot that like they literally mind wipe people so they don't like remember the monsters, the aliens. Dude, that's so that's so perfect. I'm I'm sure that the leader of the Reapers would kill for something like that to wipe the minds of people. Yeah. Dude, maybe so they well. use, maybe oh, ideas ideas forming ideas forming. <laughs> okay, we'll see right. an interest post in like two hours on Abtab. And actually, that's the one other thing that I will plug, the Absolute Tabletop official Facebook group. Get in there. That's how this game happened, and it's full of awesome people like these guys. Yeah, dude, for sure, man. Yeah, if you want to get into games like this, like, you guys are – my channel isn't very big, so I'm sure that most of the people who are, like, actually subscribed to my channel are, like, people already in AppTab. But uh, if you like games like this and you're not a part of the Absolute Tabletop Facebook community, go join it because games like this happen there on the regular, like, all the time. So uh, if you want to play in games, like you don't have a home group, or like you just want to try out online, go there. You will find people to play with. All right. Um, as always, if you're turning into this on my channel, uh, I am Tyler from the channel on a roll, ROE League like Roleplay. You can't miss it. It's right here beneath me. If you can't, look at that and then put it in and search. I mean, if you're watching on my channel, then you should know what my channel is. Um, regardless, I mean, some people might not get that, uh, so I have to explain it every single time. Corey knows this, and he makes fun of me incessantly for it. Um, but yeah, no, this is my uh, setting of Providence. It is a wild western meets supernatural bizarre horror uh, meets apparently the Men in Black, uh, like all sorts of like stuff going on here. It's, it's very, very fun. I love this setting. Um, but yeah, one thing I want to plug, um, if you want uh, to go and like see other fantastic campaigns uh, that have been run through that group, and actually the founders of AppTab, uh, they play a game called The Provokers, uh, and it has started back up again recently. You can go check it out on A Fistful of Dice, that's a channel on YouTube, um, run by Matt Click. Go check it out. Uh, great game, uh, fantastic cast of players, a lot of fun. Um, let's go ahead and get back into it. Uh, we're going to start back up uh, after Eddie has explained everything to August and after you guys have found and uh, corralled uh, our clockwork brawler uh, as well. Um, so you guys would, where would you guys have met up? Where would you guys be currently? Where would you have, where would you guys have found Jack? At the bordello, probably, with candy or somebody? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I'd probably be out looking for them, uh, going to accuse them of uh, framing me. So is there a shouting match in, like, the town square or something when you guys run into each other? I mean, that's how I would handle things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so where did you guys take them to calm them down then, uh, August and Eddie? I think uh, we would have tried to take him to the, the most neutral bar that we could, uh, if such a thing exists in High Hope. <laughs> that, would, that, would be, that would be the one. Snake Bite Saloon. It's individually owned. That's why okay, all the fights cool. happen there. <laughs> yeah, so I think we would have taken him there and trying to find a table uh, either out, out back or in the corner or something. Um, yeah, to, to, to try and suss it out. Okay, well, let, let's start off there then. Uh, you guys have just barely sat down. Um, Corey Biceps is still fuming, and uh, you guys go ahead, talk it out. Do you have an inside voice? Because if you do, use it. My voice always comes from inside. I speak the truth. Not like you two liars. Huh? You stole my key, framing me for murder? Whatever I do to you, my, huh? My cards were stolen too. We're all being framed. Question is, Hello. Who, who and why? You boys, you boys got many enemies in High Hope? Nah, I'm the friendliest dude around. But uh, I don't know about you, shady fella. 
Maybe this has got more to do with you than me. I got no beef with you, my friend. You've made me, you over the over the years, you've made me more money than uh, any other fighter. So, uh, I don't know, what kind of shady shit are y'all into that's got me mixed up in this? We're living here. We're bathing in shady shit every damn day. You, me, every every sad sack you pass on the street. Shady shit. Well, I don't know. I think we go find this witness, shake him down, get him to change his story. Obviously, he wasn't thinking straight. I don't know who he is, though. Yeah, I was going to say, Eddie, Eddie lies, look, looks at August for a moment. And then lies to Jack. We don't know who the witness is, though, do we? Well, I sure as shit don't. How about we shake down Sheriff Mitchell? He wasn't telling me, but maybe if three hombres roll up on him, he'll be more apt to talking. Boy, are you trying to find a shortcut to the fucking uh, hangman's Hell room? yeah. I ain't got time to waste shortcuts in my way of life, man. We got two days to figure this out. You roll up to the sheriff's office, blowing steam, stomping your feet around. You're going to end up in a cell today. Well, fuck. You assholes got any leads? Because I sure don't. That's why we're here. To discuss. Figure Who's it out. the one who died? Some fucker white star. I don't know. I He bet on me against me. He lost. I don't know. Sheriff thinks that's the reason I'd kill him, which I fucking have no idea why he'd think that. That, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, do I do I recognize that name or anything like that? Uh, yeah, roll me... No, actually, no, you would remember Wyatt. Uh, drinking buddy. Um, gambling buddy. Uh, you guys would probably have met uh, frequently at the... Um, called the Croton Inn. Um, he was a frequent attendee there. Uh, he would, you know that he was actually in quite a bit of debt to the Croton. Man liked his vices. Owed the Crotons quite a bit. Anybody else know anything about him? Didn't know him that well. Hmm. He'd do wow. funny shit when he's drunk. If he lost a bunch of money betting against me, and then he owed your boys a lot of money, how do we know it just wasn't them settling the debt the old way? Well, that don't make no sense. You don't kill people who owe you money. And why would they pin it on the three of us, not just you? I guess it's unclear whether he's directing that at Jack or August, because August is sort of in with the Crotons, isn't he? But Jack was the one who like won the fight. So Yeah, I don't know. This is some horse shit. Should probably just leave town before we get fucking arrested in a wagon somewhere, getting fucking threatened with somebody's shotgun. Well I've lived too many of my years shivering in the dark north. I'd rather uh, stay your head south. But hard to do that when you have some uh, arm to the teeth fucking peacekeepers aiming to take your head off your shoulders. Hmm. You know, we can find another witness that says it wasn't us, and then they couldn't really do anything about that, could they? Well, whatever happened to plausible deniability? Haven't we all got reasonable alibis? Yeah, true. I mean, but you, lady, should have spoke up for me. Maybe instead of shaking down the sheriff, since we still got our two days, maybe we go and speak to your ladies. But I reckon the sheriff. 
the sheriff spoken to them. We'll see if he actually came through, say what kind of questions he was asking. Try and get it straight. I guess but it doesn't hurt to have a backup plan if we got another another witness. He says with air quotes. Trouble is, he leans in um, and slides his glass. I assume we've all got a glass of whiskey. <laughs> slides his glass closer as he leans in. Trouble is. Nettie tells me there was a fourth uh, perpetrator that was spoken about by the witness. Although apparently nobody got a real good look at him. Sure as shit had a good enough look at the three of us. Anybody know where this killing was uh, perpetrated? Yeah, it was in the rat's den, shithole part of town. Don't know where specifically. West Let's go check it out. I guess. I think we still shake down the sheriff for the witness. I mean, that's the source of the story, right? Well, heck, maybe we can get the the name of the fourth man, or at least the description. Good For all point. we know. For all we know, that son of a bitch could have been the one who did it. Kept himself, <laughs> kept his own description neatly covered, but uh, got ourselves thrown into the pot. I don't know. And he pauses for a moment. And looks, looks at, at you, Jack, and says, so you're in with the Martells. Looks at you, August. You're in with the Crotons. And I'm stuck in with the Prestons. I mean, I don't know about in. I just <laughs> find their events and go to their establishments and occasionally do some mild work for them. But it's like not an official thing. Hey, man, you call it what you want. I bet if I ask them, they'd tell me you're in with them. You're under their thumb. Whoa. I'm under nobody's thumb, right? I'm my own man. Do what I want every day. Can't tell me what to do. Well, right, you know what? I'm going to go over to the sheriff's place right now. Maybe we should just let them get locked up. <laughs> We'll be out of the way at least. Well, how about this? Word if y'all don't come for you to hear. You go warm him up. We'll come in after you. Yeah, Pile you go on. ahead. Let him know we're coming. Man, fuck you guys. I know you fucking with me right now. Well, shit. You don't want to go there? I'll follow you wherever the hell we're going. But we got two days to figure this out. I think we should uh, go to the crime scene, see what we can find. I don't know. That's what that's what cops do, right? They they fucking dust shit, try to find fingerprints yeah, and shit like that. I don't know. Uh, you tell yeah, me, we, Detective. Fuck. We can't trust. Cop. We can't trust. <laughs> Uh, you gonna look for footprints in the sand? How about you? You got some nature magic boo bullshit wooju you could call on here? <laughs> August chuckles at that. <laughs> I, I can look for footprints, and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a bad idea. I ain't no nature man. <laughs> well, uh, no, I don't know. Ru Running our own investigation might be the best use of our two days, or at least the first the first of the two. We can't trust the investigation that's happening by the law. That's we right. That's why we need ourselves. to intercede. We need to get it right. All right. We, we have a separate investigation. They have their own investigation. They say, hey, you guilty. We say we're not. Well, man, we fucked. 
Boy, I thought your plan was Ain't going to shake real. down the sheriff. You're saying this like it's your idea now. I'm just saying, man, we let them run their own investigation and we try and be, I ain't a deputy. You ain't a deputy. You're a gangster, I'm assuming, judging by outfit and appearance. So uh, I don't know what else we could do besides some thug ass shit. Usually I don't do thug ass shit when the law's already looking at me. Hey, ain't nothing mm. illegal about going down asking a few questions. But you're right. I mean, I'm folks go down to folks go down to the rats den every day and have a drink. Why not? No, ain't nothing suspicious about us. I'm just us saying, y'all don't y'all don't think it's important to find out who this witness is. I mean, either they're lying or they're mistaken. Those are the two options, or maybe they're partially right. I guess that would fall under mistaken, though, that you two did it and I'm innocent. You know what? Let's go find where it happened and see if we could find one of our own witnesses. All right, Let's I'm go. agreeable to this. Uh, yeah, Eddie Tyler, are there the any like, uh, are there any like uh, street urchin hangouts or like bars or places where uh, August would know to go? Down, down in the rat den? Like near where this happened, if we know where it happened. Yeah, no, so there, there is um, like a hangout uh, more than anything. It's called the nest. Uh, it's like, it's like a rat's nest, basically. Uh, where like, literally everybody in who lives on the west end of the rat's nest part of the town, they all go to this. This is like their bar, but it like sucks. Like they literally don't have whiskey. All they have is like financial like juice and snake spit. Like, just, like, the really crappy, crude liquor. Um, so there's all, like, sorts of, like, seedy, crappy gambling. And people only go there, like, because everyone cheats, like, there. Like, there's no, nobody stopping them from cheating. Uh, so the only reason why people go there is because it's the only game in town. Like, and, and for them, because they can't go to the nicer places. So, yeah, there's the nest. Uh, you could go there. Uh, I mean, there are homes in the vicinity. Maybe somebody saw something from their window. Uh, you know where it happened. It was on the street. There's a street called West End. Um, that it supposedly happened on that street, stuff like that. All right. I know a few places we can check. Finish your drinks. You're not going to like the stuff they serve there. He downs it. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie downs his too and just stands up. Ready to leave. Is Jack standing up? Uh, yeah, Jack wouldn't even finish his drink. Just push it in. Stand up and kind of huff off with you. Eddie would finish Jack, his Jack drink. is so... I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, um, he didn't do shit. It's these fucks. Guarantee it. <laughs> um, Jack... You spent a lot of time around spirits, around strange supernatural things that nobody can explain. I want you to roll me a perception check, but using your intelligence modifier. Okay. 19. You're stepping out of this bar. And maybe it's just instinct. In fact, it's probably just instinct. But you kind of turn and look back into the Snakebite Saloon, kind of scanning the crowd. And you blink. And for the briefest of moments, you're able to, you know, see these things, to see the spirits, essentially. And everything looks normal and you see a flicker that disappears just as soon as you see it in the back of the room, right next to where your table was. Do I, do I recognize what this flicker might be? Uh, roll me, roll me a nature, well, uh, roll me like nature or history or religion, whatever you feel best in for those three. Uh, 
I'll go with that young religion check. Crit. You crit? Yeah. This was definitely a Delod spirit walking. Holy shit. Can they, like... They can listen in on conversations and stuff. So when they spirit walk, can they, like, leave the body they're in and just walk around and then go back? Yeah. Is that how that works? Fuck. I'm real tempted to use my spirit sight. Well, you know the spirit's gone because it was there only briefly uh, and it slipped back I out see. on the back wall. I see. Got it. Okay. I'll have to deal with that later, I guess. It's fucking spirit. Here man. from outside. Well, you, you get the sense that it was listening to you guys. It was listening in. Yeah. Hmm. So Jack just kind of stands there a little bit longer. So the other two would kind of rush him along. He wouldn't say anything though, and then just follow and follow behind him. Yeah, you make your way down to the rat's den. Um, the like the falling apart uh, slum shanty town, uh, kind of on the western uh, southwestern edge of uh, of High Hope, and like the change is almost immediate. Uh, you know immediately once you've stepped into the rat's den. The, the buildings become just super scrubby. Like, think of it like corrugated metal just, like, stacked up against each other, like a literal shanty town. Um, buildings are made of, like, thin, like, plywood and, like, these, like, metal plating, and, like, that's it. Uh, the door, some of these houses don't even have doors. They just have, like a, like, a piece of cloth just draped over the doorway. They are living in squalor. The only way you survive in this town is by selling yourself to one of the bosses, one of the mob bosses. Uh, one of the four families. And these are the people who haven't figured that out yet or figured it out too late after they were in too much debt. So um, as you're kind of moving through the streets, you guys are like obviously like, even though you're wearing just normal clothes, you are dressed better than literally three quarters of the people who live here. Like they're living, they're, they're wearing rags. They're like thin. Uh, and you always, you can recognize a new arrival, somebody who's just barely arrived in the city and has been trapped here. Uh, by the fact that they look a little bit well, more like better fed and better watered than other people, uh, like they don't look dehydrated and miserable. Uh, but you know that over the course of the next few months, they are going to become that way. So as you kind of make your way uh, through the rat's den, you get stares. People look at you because, I mean, people like you who have essentially sold yourselves to these big families, they don't come here unless they have to, and it's very rare that they have to. So as you make your way through the town, uh, through the shanty town, um, you're getting a lot of looks, and uh, a lot of a lot of them aren't very good. These are desperate people, and desperate people do desperate things. <laughs> so you reach this kind of intersection you have to go through um, to make your way uh, the rest of the way uh, to the nest or to this, you know, the area, the general area that's happened in. Um, and I want. Uh, each of you to roll me either perception or investigation or insight to read the scene, to read, like get a feeling for the scene as well, if insights that you're good at. Uh, 11 insight. 13 21 perception. 21 perception. If you reach this intersection, uh, I'm going to say that Dan's the one who spots this, uh, that August is. And that's probably because you maybe have spent more time with the desperate people, especially working with the Crotons. Uh, they, you know, desperate people are kind of their business. Um, so as you're moving towards this kind of intersection, you see that it's kind of like this area where like six different paths kind of like converge on this one central area. Uh, you hear like footsteps behind you. You look over your shoulder, you see there's a small group of like maybe 15 people. And as you're moving down, uh, you see that on the opposite road directly across from you, there's maybe like a small group of like 10. And as you reach this kind of central area, you kind of look to your side and you see that there's another group coming from your left and your right, leaving you guys with like two different roads. And these people look hungry. They look tired. They look stressed. They look desperate and miserable. And they are looking at you. All right. Let's... Uh... Go somewhere a little more crowded, I think. Come on! And he kind of uh, 
usher them to uh, one of the bars to avoid these crowds in the, in the dark streets. Boy, I sure do feel like this is a good idea. I don't think we made any kind of mistake coming down here, returning to the scene of the crime. I mean, going to the scene of the crime. <laughs> you're, going, you're going into a random hole in the wall bar? Uh... <laughs> well, are you rolling the dice? Like, like like I said, you know, there, there are two empty streets. There's one directly to your left diagonal and one to your right diagonal in front of you. Oh man! So you, can make, you can make a break for right. it. You can try and run and make a break for it if you want to. Um, you could. I mean, it's up to you guys. How do you want to approach this? Wait, so uh, these there, are just like are, a bunch of hungry people that look desperate. Like they look yeah, like, like they look almost zombie-like as they approach you. Like they. You roll insight. I didn't roll. I only got eleven. Oh. This they okay was it eleven? Um, I'm gonna give you the basis of reads on what these people look like. They look like zombies, and they look like zombies who see their next meal. Uh, yeah. So I would look <laughs> to my left of the guy and say, "So, uh, <clears throat> y'all ever do cardio train? You know, pretty fit. Kind of like maybe like kind of punch August on the shoulder. Kind of like see his like." physical response to being roughed up. Cut the uh, shit out. I'm just saying, we might need to make a run for it. You know, we can't have any more dead bodies on our hands, so those guns aren't really going to be useful, you know what I mean? Uh... Yeah, we'd better leg it. I think yep. would, um, as Eddie notices, August may be looking around like nearby to sort of see where we can go and get ourselves trapped as far as Eddie sees it. But he's like, you know, slaps you on the shoulder like, um, run, boys, and, um, and starts booking it down the left-hand uh, path or open street. Yeah. You're muted. We are now entering a chase. Everybody roll initiative. Shit. Woo! Do I get advantage because I'm hella fast? <laughs> no, I'm just roll. Um, I mean, I'm just saying. I got 40, 40 feet of movement speed. You get triple advantage because of all your cardio training. <laughs> and I can use some of my machismo to run double fast. Okay, well, we know the monk is going to have an issue escaping the crowd. Like... <laughs> I got okay, 18, 16. 16, 16. Okay, yeah, you guys, you guys beat all of them. I'm gonna hurry and uh, let me hurry and write up uh, an initiative doc. Holy cow, that is a giant notepad. My word. Okay. <laughs> if you want to dump them in the chat, I can order them for you if you like. <laughs> uh, I just like to like make it look really. I, I just do it in notepad just because it's easy for me. So we've got Eddie. Oh, cool. Yeah. 18. We've got August. Well, actually, probably Corey. Uh, Jack, what's your, what are your guys' uh, dexterities? Two. Oh. Uh, bu, 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 bu. This is probably better than four. Yeah. You have four? Okay. Plus four. Yeah, we're level August. four, right? Yeah, we're, you guys are level four. Mm -hmm. August 16. We got Jack, 16, Mob 1, uh, 14, Mob 2, 12, Mob 3. Multiple mobs. Perfect. I oh, am, yeah, man. You guys are you guys are running through the rats then, dude. They know these streets better than anybody. Oh god. I love it. I love how it's like our destination is not probably gonna be any safer. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no, probably not. <laughs> All right, Eddie, uh, you chose to go. Are you guys you guys going to the left street then? Is that consensus? Uh, that's where Eddie's heading. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. mean, I guess I'll follow the group. <laughs> I guess. Okay, go ahead and uh, go ahead and give me give me your uh, you know your movements and stuff. Uh, keep in mind that you can only dash action in a chase. 
a number of times equal to your constitution modifier before you have to start making exhaustion checks uh, to dash. Hmm. Oh, all up during the whole chase? Yep, over the course of the entire okay. chase before you lose them. Right, okay. Um, so yeah, you can you can do so other you, things, like barrels in the way, and that counts as your action instead of dashing. So just keep that in mind. Right, okay. Cool, okay. So it's different to a skill, skill challenge. This sounds cool. Um, as a rogue, I have a cunning action where, where I can dash, disengage, or hide. Um, so I think, yeah, he'll he'll book it down that left-hand road uh, with his 30-foot speed, and <laughs> he, let's get a great start here. So 30 feet movement, he'll use the dash action for his main action for another 30 feet, is that? And then cunning action as dash as well. Can I do that? Yeah, so you're going to move 120 feet on your first move? That would have been 90, I think. Oh. Oh, yeah, 90. 30, eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 32 times, yeah. Yeah, he, le he legs it. He gave you guys the heads up, but he's legging it. <laughs> yeah, dude, he takes off like an Olympic sprinter. Just <laughs> Like, he's gone, man. Like, he, like, where he was standing, there's just an after image. In fact, he left behind a suit coat floating in the air. <laughs> like Wiley Coyote. Yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. roadrunner's like running next to me. Meep. <laughs> yeah, so he just he just takes off. Like he just there's no bit there's no nonsense. Uh, you can tell that he is a pressed man because there's no nonsense in what he's doing right now. He just just takes off. August. Uh, so he's the roadrunner, and August is Wily e. Coyote. He only has a thirty foot movement, and he doesn't have super special tricks like that. So uh, he's gonna run thirty, and then he's going to dash. I <laughs> Remember that time we were playing D and D, and two of us ran away, and the third one got left and died. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> So you're just going to dash 60? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you sprint off after him. Um, I mean, you're 30 feet behind him. He's running fast. Uh, but you're going to make it, like, into that side street. Um, ooh, that is that is tough, my friend, Keel. Uh, he fails his con save. He takes a point of exhaustion. <laughs> so that means uh, the first point of exhaustion is uh, – let me see. It's disadvantage on ability checks, I think. Caution 5e rules. Uh, man, this is really, I have so many freaking tabs open. Okay, yeah, disadvantage on ability checks. Perfect. Dude, your second point of exhaustion, your speed's have, dude. Don't don't blow yourself out, man. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to start throwing some barrels, I think. <laughs> yeah, dude, you're going to have to start Donkey Konging these guys. <laughs> okay, yeah, you you just you sprint off. August is right behind you. Uh, keep in mind, remember, uh, that you can only sprint a number of times equal to your con modifier before you have to start making exhaustion saves. Yeah, so you sprint off after him, uh, August. <laughs> uh, we can tell that uh, Kiel's character is a sprinter uh, because one dash and he is exhausted. Uh, he is not a long-distance runner. Okay, uh, Jack, your turn. All right, so I see everyone run away, and Jack just thinks to himself, well, I'm glad I didn't skip leg day. As he uh, buckles down and runs 120 feet away. Is that a double dash? Yeah, so that's, that's move, dash, and then step of the wind to dash. Okay, um, what, what's your what's your uh, what's your con modifier? Uh, three. So I still got one more. You got three. one more dash left. One more dash. Well, before saves, so really before two saves. at least. Yeah, he's been doing squats. He's been he's been making sure he's doing those deadlifts. As I'm as I'm running, is there anything on the rooftops that looks like I might be able to like rip down or use in order to kind of slow things up? Yeah, there there are like these like clothes lines that have kind of been stretched between these houses. Um, they're like on thick cords, so they like they don't get blown away in the wind when it gets like windy or like stormy, uh, which is hardly ever now in Providence, but it still happens. Um, but there are like these cords that are stretched between houses uh, that you see. There's a like, clothing hanging off of them. 
Uh, you see that a, several of these houses have like these like makeshift rain barrels that they kind of set out in front of the houses, like three or four of them, just to catch water if it ever rains. Um, those are options. Uh, like obviously there's garbage everywhere, like kind of piled up in the streets and on the side. You can tip some of that over. And there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, you see like an old wagon, like a horse wagon that might have once gotten a family here, but now is unhitched to anything. Uh, that's kind okay. of like resting on the side of the street. Like there's all sorts of stuff you can use. All right. So uh, during during that move, I guess I would run up and uh, like kind of jump up to the roof as I'm like running along, and then pull off some of the cord from the clotheslines um, as I for progress. First, okay, for each clothesline you're gonna down, I'm gonna take away ten feet of movement because you're gonna have to stop and undo it and drop it. Rip. I'll do it on my next turn. We'll end on one on a roof, 120 feet away with a clothesline. There we okay. Go. Cool. All right. Uh, the mobs. Um, they are going to like, you hear them like the one directly behind you, like stop, like in surprise, you guys just take off. And then you hear the padding, like of bare feet slapping on like stone and dirt and like garbage as they run after you. Um, all the mobs are going to take a dash check, uh, while they're going to take the dash action. And the mob that was directly in front of you is immediately going to turn to the side and start running through alleyways. Um, they're going to burst out, uh, right next to you, uh, who moved the least? August, right? August, there is like, so there's like fences that are kind of like between some of these houses and some of them are just open alleyways. You see them, like a group of them running down an alleyway towards you and then one of the fences is suddenly like they're climbing over the top of it. It's like a zombie movie. Like you guys are like running and they're like coming out of niches and crannies and over the top of like, like fences and like through like alleyways and out of houses. Like they're like coming after you. Now I remember why I never come here. God damn it! What the fuck? He's. <laughs> uh, yeah, they they come pouring out of these alleyways, and like you see, um, that one of the doors kind of to your side opens actually, uh, and a man steps out, and he sees like the horde chasing you, and he sees like what you're wearing, like how well dressed you are, and and you have to you have to remember that in their eyes, you are the people who have done this to them, even if you're not. You're their lackeys, their cronies, and you're in their territory now. And so he reaches around behind the door, and you see him pull out this, like, old, terrible rifle. And he's going <laughs> to lift it, and he's going to aim it down the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he Definitely. sees them all closing in on you, August, and he's going to aim down the street at Eddie who's in front of you, and he's going to try and leg you. He's going to try and kneecap you with his rifle. Right on. My AC is actually 14. Sorry, Tyler. I uh, was a dumb dumb and didn't add my dex bonus. Dude, all good, man. I'm like, 11? That seems so low. <laughs> You're like, why would a rogue have, like, a neg one dex modifier? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll fix that for you. Um, but I'll remember that you have 14 from now on. I'm going to give you a plus um, two bonus AC. Uh, because he's aiming at your leg specifically. Um, but if he hits you, I'm going to need you to make me a deck save. Right on. Um, and I'm also going to roll for Mistfire, because this thing is old, rusted, and crappy. <laughs> so luck die. Come on, oh, dude. Luck die. Okay. And here comes the shot. Dude, everything is stacked against this guy. He raises the rifle. Uh, you look over your shoulder briefly, Eddie. You see he's aiming at you. And as he pulls the trigger, it explodes in his hand. This, this janky piece of crap, rusty rifle explodes in his hand. You see, like, fire, like, explode out of the, like, behind the hammer as the bullet detonates in the chamber instead of firing and just scorch this dude. He falls back into his house, like, screaming, uh, dropping the rifle. Uh, but now are the attacks that are coming on you, August. I'm going to say three people can get to you. And they're just going to be making, like, fist attacks and, like, swinging, like, fence posts at you. <laughs> uh, that's a 13, which I think misses you. Uh, 13, uh, 15, and 18. 18 hits. Okay. Yeah, like, there's one, one of this guy runs up. He's got, like, a, like, a, like a fence board, like, one of the flat boards, and it has the nails still in it. And they're rusty. They're nasty looking. You see that they're like dark instead of like the, na the nice shiny metal. And you see he swings it overhead and he's going to hit you in the back with it. And you just feel it pierce you along the back. Just, 
you're like, oh man, I hope I got my tetanus shots as this thing just rips into you. And it's going to be a makeshift club, so I'm going to roll a d4 for it. Okay, that is max damage. That is four plus three. Uh, so that's seven points. As this rusty, nasty board smacks into your back, tearing into your flesh. And you, you just Hold feel like, the, the, the dirt like leave it inside your skin. You telling me these guys got a plus three strength? Uh, no, it, it's it's versatile. It's dex. Oh, uh, okay. I was like, damn. <laughs> yeah, dude, they're they're super they're super <laughs> super jacked. Just <laughs> got out of the of fitness. Jack zombies. <laughs> they're, they're the dude, muscle <laughs> zombies. <laughs> they're mal they're mal <laughs> supermen. <laughs> And that hit August, right? That one, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, hit that me. hit August. Um, but yeah, so they're like closing in. Uh, this guy stepped out of it and he shot at you. It exploded in his hand. One dude smacks August across the back with his board with nails in it, and the chase is on. Eddie, your turn. Yeah, since Eddie was looking over his shoulder, just as this 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 old geezer's uh, old rifle blew up in his face. I think he then sees out of the corner of his eye behind him as he's still sort of running, uh, sees the mob descend on August um, while he's still trying to run, but some of them have caught up to him since they're pouring out of these places uh, as we run along, I imagine it. So um, I think, does it look like that they're going to like, like uh, be able to stop August from, from moving forward? Um, I know he's still running himself, but I mean, it, he might take opportunity attack if he doesn't disengage. But you you look up and you see that uh, Jack is on the roof, ready to drop some clothing lines on these people. Uh, so if he times it well, they'll probably slow them down so August can get a little bit of a distance between him and them. Yeah. Okay. Um. So Eddie would keep the momentum with his movement. Then he would um do a full full movement forward and um. Are there any people ahead of me at this point, or they're all behind us? Um, as far as you can tell, they're us? they're they're all behind you. But roll me a perception check as you glance to the side. Um, that's sixteen on the die. Sorry. Ah, so seventeen. As you kind of glance to the side, because you turn back and you see this guy, and he, the rifle explodes in his hand. You kind of tar start to turn back, and you see. Uh, Jack standing on the rooftop, but like between two of these houses, you catch a glimpse of of, of one of these mobs running parallel to you guys on the awesome. left side. <laughs> the ones on the right just came straight through. The ones on the left are running parallel to you, trying to keep up. Okay, that's epic. So, so he's calculating then, I guess, uh, while he's keeping the movement, uh, the momentum up, calculating how best he can try and anticipate or prevent these this mob from breaking through as well so um so maybe would he see up ahead like um maybe uh, another crossroad or a, a wide alleyway that this mob that's running parallel might pour through that he can try and sort of um do some some tipping stuff over up there or whatever to try and hinder them what, what was your perception check um it's actually 19 sorry not 17. okay yeah, um, as you kind of like, you see this, you're like, oh crap, like they are trying to pincer us. Like they are literally making a flanking maneuver. Like some, like in their desperation, they are being tactical geniuses. Uh, you would see this yeah. space, yeah, space up in front of you and to the left, where it's like a larger, wider alleyway where they are probably going to come from. Roll me a luck die, a D8. Oh boy. Eight. In that same road like kind of like in like right next to that like row they're going to come up to try and cut you off and pincer you you would actually see just sitting off to the side of the road uh what looks like this huge water barrel that somehow in the years ended up getting here um and it is kind of like sitting kind of tipped on its side a little bit on like the gutter like this like little kind of raised lip of uh rock and stone it's kind of sitting tipped there uh towards you it's going to take a strength check to move but if you can roll it down this hill, you might be able to stop them completely from getting to you. Oh, definitely try that. Um, anything you can do to 
yeah, stop them rather than having to pull out his gun and actually start murdering people uh, is, is better in his eyes. So movements used, he'll use his action uh, to try and do that then. Um, so strength check. I've got a disadvantage because I'm exhausted. Okay. So I will have to clarify that you have to take the dash action to get there. Oh, sorry. Okay. Where is it? Is it by me? No. So it's like another 30 feet in front of you. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. You'll take the dash action. So I'll make okay. a con save. Oh, yep. fuck, dude. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. Is this con save going to be an advantage? It's not an ability check. It's a save. So. No, it's, it's, a not save, a so it's not a disadvantage. It's normal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's a four again <laughs> dude you you like are heaving uh essentially after you push this barrel you're going to have to take a turn not moving to get your speed back yeah okay you have to take a turn to rest to catch your breath oh man i thought you were just gonna punish him here well <laughs> i mean i could but like at the same time like it would kill him Risk for reward, yeah, right? I <laughs> Jack is there. He'll be fine. Okay, so you get up to the barrel, um, uh, but you're heaving at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I'll uh, use my action to try and um, push it then down the hill, which is a disadvantage. Which <laughs> is a three. Yeah, you're like putting your shoulder into it, but your foot slips in the muck. And you fall, your knee splashes in something you don't want to know what it is. Uh, and you kind of pull yourself back up to your feet and you just don't have any strength. You know, like when you work out like too hard, your body just trembles. It's like that. Like your body is just trembling. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And he's, um, yeah, he's like wheezing with, um, with his, while breathing heavily. Um, and actually I'll use my cunning action to hide. Oh, Nice. Okay, yeah, you could like hide between the barrel and the wall. There's like a little indent inside of the barrel where you could slip in. Awesome. Okay, yeah, go ahead and give me your uh, your stealth check at disadvantage. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, that, let's see. That's a nine on the die. Uh, so that is 12. Okay. Yeah, you, you kind of like squeeze it your way in there and you're just like, you're back against the wall and just like breathing like <gasps> as you're trying to catch your breath. Um, take a point of inspiration, dude. You're, uh, you're coming up with some good plans, some good ideas trying to, trying to solve this ish. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'll use that to cancel out one of my checks next <laughs> round. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you press yourself up against the wall just like breathing heavily and uh, we're going to go ahead and switch to August. Uh, you've just taken a, a nail board to the back. Um, and you like stumble. Uh, it hurts. All right. Um, what would he do here? Can he? Uh, can he grab one of the garbage? No, oh, that'd be an action to pick it up and use it as a shield. Um, no, no. Uh, picking up objects and stuff like that—that's that's a move. That's part of your movement. But so you'd have to sacrifice movement to do it. Nah, I'm good. Uh, he's gonna... Hmm. Does it seem like these guys are just gonna keep up with him if he keeps dashing? Uh, they might try. I mean, they. I don't know how... So basically, I've given um, the mobs like an ability where they can try and dash a second time on their turn if they succeed on a con check. Um, you guys just got unlucky last time because they succeeded. Ah, uh, okay. Uh... Hmm. Should he take the dash or should he take the dodge here? Um, so he sees the two guys who just like left him in the dust. Uh, it seems like they they have something cooking with that barrel. Um, if the barrel uh, gets pushed, would it just like go right through me, basically? Uh, they're trying to use it to cut off the ones that are parallel to you guys on the left side. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. In that case. Um, he's going to dash away and take the opportunity text. Okay, there are only three within range right now, so it's probably a good call. 
Uh, miss, miss, and a natural 20. Of course, there's always ah, one. Okay. Classic. Um, I'm going to say it's just one of the dudes who's carrying like a stick. So it's just going to do a D4 damage. I think he has like a brick. And by D4 yeah, nails no, and arrows and shit. 20 damage. Yeah, dude, he's got, he's got a brick uh, that he's throwing at you as you're starting to run. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's two points plus his dex, so five doubled so 10 um he just throws it at you and it's just a, a lucky throw it clocks you on the back of the head uh you you, you feel it like the impact just, boop, as it just hits you in the skull your mind your eyes kind of like go a little bit blurry actually i'm gonna use a uh, one of, i'm gonna spend some points on the uh crit roll oh no Is there any there that uh reduces speed or cognitive ability <laughs> mate you're um, on our team <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna second wind as a bonus action then. We're about we're about to death spiral, boys. Hooray! Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, dash again. Oh, it's three levels of exhaustion. That's fine. <laughs> this is okay. This is a bad. This is about oh, as mini as a campaign gets. TPK in session one. <laughs> yeah, all of us die just like, oh, good, I wasn't there. <laughs> Look, yep. All part um, of the plan. So I'm going to spend five points um, to do a torso uh, damage to you. So it hits you in the back of the neck, actually. And uh, the target is winded and has minus two to all skill checks and attacks until the end of their next turn. Ooh, I should make that all... Actually, no, I'll just make it all skill checks and save, not attack. Okay, that's what it is now. Skill checks and save. That yeah. makes more sense. Second wins, he gets 11 back. Okay. Um, and you dashed, or have you exceeded your dash threshold yet? No, nah, he's uh, he has a three con bonus. Oh, okay, cool. So you've got one more. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, uh, you dash. Uh, you take this one brick to the back of the neck. Um, as you kind of and you stumble, uh, it's actually, it's actually, I, I think it's better than a break. It's like a terracotta tile, like that somebody just like side armed at you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so he, he hits you in the back of the neck, uh, this like uh, clay tile essentially, and you kind of stumble. Uh, it hurts really bad. Um, you feel like your bot, like your neck and like the area around it kind of start to numb a bit, so your chest starts to heave, and you kind of like pull yourself to your feet and you keep running, uh, and you're going to make it. Um, to the top of the street, uh, you can see like 30 feet in front of you, uh, your friend, um, or rather your ally, Eddie, uh, kind of like crouching. He's not hiding very well, uh, crouching between this barrel and the wall. Uh, and now it's uh, Jack's turn. Is he is he in the barrel or is he crouching next to it? He's like he's like between the barrel and the wall. There's like a little like you know how like barrels have like a little lip around it where the lid goes like tamped down. Yeah. Like he's like between that and the wall, like kind of like hiding between there. Okay. Breathing super heavily. <laughs> so loudly. And you said he was like 30 feet away from me? Yeah, he's like 30 feet away from you. So you could drop some clotheslines and then go to him go to him to help him push the barrel. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm gonna throw the clotheslines out there just to try and get something in the okay. way. And maybe they Look, get so here's what I'm going to have you do. Because your friend is still running down there. Make me ranged, mel, ma, ma, ranged weapon attacks using your intelligence modifier. Because you have to time them. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Get it. I got it. 13. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so how many are you dropping? How many lines? Um, each, I mean, just a couple. Each line, each line will tangle up like three or four people. Each line will tangle up three or four people? Damn. Um, or at least slow down three or four people. Yeah. I mean, I guess I would just throw however many were there. Hey, okay, oh, remember so that each one each one takes ten feet of movement from you. Ah, uh, okay, I see. Uh, yes, I would do that. You're gonna drop just one, or like two or three? How many? Uh, three. You're gonna drop all three. Okay. Yeah. So make me uh two more with advantage. Two more. And now, so one with advantage. Uh, nineteen. Okay, cool, perfect. And then one more with advantage because you succeeded on the first two. Nineteen. Yeah, so you're gonna tie up like nine people um, that are chasing directly behind uh, 
you know, your ally. So this, this group that's directly behind you is definitely going to slow down significantly. They're going to have to do their double dash thing to try and catch up. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so he's like tied boards in the clothesline, throwing them out there. Um, and then I'm going to use some macho points. Some machismo? <laughs> the, nice, dude. A, a macho point for the move speed. Uh, then I'm going to run over to, uh, to Eddie and go, the hell are you doing over here? We got to run. There's another, another mob coming in from the side. And so uh, he would reach down and like grab him and then pull him out of the same motion, like kick the barrel down the way that they're coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm literally seeing, I'm literally seeing like this character being like a Hercules, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just go ahead. Make me, uh, so make me uh, it's your form. You gotta lift with your legs. Give me an athletic check. Oh no, that's a bummer. I rolled a two, but it's still a nine. I, uh, dude, take my inspiration. Can I give him inspiration or something? Oh yeah. Oh, I still haven't. Yeah, that's right. I haven't used the inspiration from that I had from before. <laughs> I meant. 26. Dude, the barrel flies. It is, it's like it's been shot from a howitzer. No, yeah, it, it, it like, for a second, you're, like, afraid it's not going to move. But then, like, you just lean into it and push, and it just, it's like a Donkey Kong barrel. It's, like, bouncing as it rolls down this hill. You actually, it's, um, what would be a good comparison to make to this? Um, you know, like, the scenes, like, where, like, just like happens and it rolls down and makes the bowling noise that hits them. Like as the people come out of the end of the alleyway, it makes that noise as they're run over by this barrel. It's like <laughs> as they all go scattering. <laughs> uh, let's see. And then if I wanted to carry him, would that take an action in order to, to, to get him? Or since he would be willing, I'm assuming, would that not be an action? Um, I would say uh, that you could pick him up and throw him over your shoulder without it being an action, but it's going to make it so that uh, whenever you dash, it counts for two dashes if you're mm. dashing with him on your shoulder. No, I would just be moving. I guess, yeah, I would, I would pick him up in anticipation of having to run with him. I've only got 10 feet of movement left, so I would move, like, I guess five or something. I think when you're carrying somebody, it's, like, half speed. Yeah. Yeah, so you move, you move half. The, yeah, okay, that's actually fair enough. When you're carrying him, it's, it's half. You have move at half speed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you move five feet uh, with him on your shoulder, and uh, I imagine that you're like dry heaving as you're bouncing up and down on this dude's shoulder, uh, Eddie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's say that he even actually like spews up a little bit on his back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh gross. <laughs> He almost drops you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So. Oh, it is. Yes. Mob's turn. Uh, the mob directly to your left is actually going to be taken out by this barrel. I'm removing them from the initiative order. Hey. So mob two, um, directly behind you is going to you try and do their double dash uh, to catch up. Um. So I have to roll a con save for them to do their second dash. And they get it okay um they are they just like start sprinting uh it is like the horde of the dead are chasing you um they are going to august they catch up to you again uh the thing three and they're going to try and swap you on the back they're giving you a friendly like push yeah 28 days later exactly uh that's two hits that's a 22 and a 24. okay so you're going to take um 2d4 damage just tempted to break out the shotgun at this point. Uh, that's going to be... Um, you take five points of damage. Uh, as Oh, no, six points. As uh, one of them kind of like uh, essentially kicks you in the back. And then another one kind of like swats you on the leg like really hard, like on the thigh with like a flat board. Uh, just giving you like the worst five star of your life. Um... But yeah, that's that's it for uh, mob two and mob three. Uh, we'll try and double dash also, I guess, and fail. Uh, so the the group that was initially behind you is falling behind very quickly. 
Uh, okay, top of the order, Eddie. Make me a con save to try uh, and remove this half speed. Alrighty. Hey, 19. Okay, your speed is no longer halved, um, but like you don't get your speed back on this turn. That was like basically an end of your turn type thing. So what are you doing on your turn? Cool. Cool. So just to be clear, end of turn, I lose that second level of exhaustion completely or just that effect? Uh, yeah, you'll just, you'll, you'll lose that effect. You can still go up to exhaustion yeah. three if you feel another save. Okay, okay. That's cool. Um, yeah. I think I was thinking I would um, hold my action, basically, um, since since Jack's carrying me, um, I hold my action, and, and if or when he drops me or has to put me down, then I'll keep running then. Eddie, uh, you're muted. Uh, roll me a perception check. You go. Oh my god. <laughs> What'd you get? Like six. Oh yeah, okay. You, I mean you hear you hear uh, it, but you wouldn't know where it's coming from. You hear barking. Oh shit. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> I'm about to drop your ass and run the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Worst yeah. idea ever. Who thought of this idea? I'm pretty sure it was August. <laughs> August, what's your, what are you doing? You just got your butt paddled, like when you were like four years old. Um, he continues running. Okay, dash action. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, three opportunity attack. Mm. But they suck this time. They all miss you. Uh, yeah, that's like an 8, a 10, and an 11. Yeah, so they all miss. Uh, they all swing wildly at you. Uh, you, you can hear that they are heaving now. Um, they failed their con save last turn. Uh, this is something you've noticed. Um, so they are, they have their first level of exhaustion now. Right. But they are, they, they, you just see this, like, desperation. Like, they, they need whatever money you have. And you know that if, if they do catch you and kill you, it's going to be a bloodbath afterwards to see who gets your purse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's going to uh, unsling oh, his shotgun and carry it in his hand at this point. Um, he's, oh. He's running out of dashes. You pull the shotgun down. Yeah. Uh, roll me intimidation. He's still running. He's not going to stop until no. he's like, fuck, but... Uh, he rolled a 19 on the die. His intimidation is plus four. So 23. Yeah, you see the leaders in this group, like this, this group of three who have kept up with you and have been hitting you. Like, you see them look at each other, and they're like, is it still worth it? Like, are we still going for this? Like, they just took out one of our groups of buddies. Like, this is, like, passing between their eyes as they look at each other. Did and, you see uh, that guy? He fucking kicked a barrel down the hill and then picked the other guy up with one hand and ran off with him at full speed. <laughs> <laughs> you see them look at each other and they like look at you and they like one of them takes a step back. He's like, dude, I'm not going any further, basically. And the other two are like, they, they like look at each other. Let me see how stupid they are. Or how desperate, I guess, technically. They look at each other and they come to the consensus that they are not following you anymore. And they kind of like step back. Like they're like, okay, yeah, we're not going after the guy with the shotgun. Like he's gotten, he's gotten serious. Like when we had the, when we were going to jump him, when we had the number advantage, like maybe, but not now. The moke. Yeah, he, he doesn't even look back. He probably just hears that the footsteps aren't clomping after him, but he would just keep, keep running. Follow okay. after him. Yeah, so you, you keep running. Um, the mob directly behind you guys backs off. So mob two falls off. Falls off and uh, you hear shouting uh, coming from, like, the groups. And mob three gives up the chase, too. And they all kind of just, like, fall back. Uh, you see them watching you. You know this isn't over. If they get more buddies, they're going to find you because they know you're in their part of the city. <laughs> we got to be quick. Yep, we're not exactly conspicuous. 
I think you mean <laughs> we're not exactly inconspicuous, but that's whatever. Just, uh, the correct. I got. Word. Uh, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's look around some more, right? <laughs> well, we don't know if it's a good idea that we didn't get a chance to look around yet. Came this far? Let's get this shit done. I'm the one who took all the hits. It'll still be worth it if we if we can clear our names. <clears throat> Went down, boy. <laughs> so yeah, I just you know put you down. Probably remark that you look like shit. <laughs> Hell, I've looked worse than this. Damn, I hate we to gotta see that. Be quick. They'll be back. And well, where the hell are we supposed to look exactly? I mean, there's not gonna be a road sign. We have to attention, go to the West End. Scene of the crime. What did they say? West. The West Road. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, with that, he'll look up to the sky to yeah, get his bearings. Yeah, um, you actually West realize End. that this kind of led you a bit in that direction. Um, if you kind of take your next right, like up at the big intersection, take your next right and kind of like follow uh, the edge of town, you'll arrive at West End. And from there, you're only a short distance from the nest. But do you guys want to proceed stealthily from here on out? <laughs> Should have done that in the first place, I think. Yeah, I guess <laughs> stealthily. Stealthily okay. it is. Uh, let's, make, let's make a group, uh, group stealth check. Um, so we're looking for majority to succeed. Uh, DC 14. DC. What's my stealthy? Oh, okay. actually 20. My bad. 20. Okay, cool. Three successes. Um, you make it there without notice, without any issue. Uh, nobody spots you. Nobody comes after you. Uh, you guys make it uh, to West End, and you can see uh, you're kind of standing at the end of the road. Uh, where the road begins, you can kind of see in the distance that there's like this really lit up kind of corner side pub, essentially, uh, that you know is the nest. Um, it's got like a picture on like, like there's like a, it, it's weird because it's almost like a medieval tavern. Like they've got like a little sign hanging out in front of it. It has like a picture of a bird's nest with three cracked eggs inside of it uh, that you know uh, this is the nest. Uh, it is getting late, by the way. The sun is definitely dipping. All right. I feel like trying to find the right person to talk to is riskier, but could leave us better off if we get lucky. I feel like the crime scene might have been picked clean by now. Well, I guess we'll just have to ask around. That's worked real well. Then the the well, recent shit. past. I wanted to ask the sheriff. At least he wouldn't chase us down the street with a bunch of nails and boards and pipes. Yeah. Speaking of which, I, I think I got. Can you check my back? And he turns around, and he has, like, a nail stuck into his shoulder. Oh. <laughs> ah, you look fine to me, man. You sure? It kind of itches. <laughs> Probably going to be infected. No. Docko. Mr. Croton is good with that kind of stuff. He'll check it out later, probably. All right, let's do this shit. And uh, you take the shotgun and uh, open the front door, like with the double doorways, like the westerns. And the, the, the uh, batwing, the batwing doors. You kick them open. Yeah. Okay. And you kick them open, and you step inside, and like a bunch of like seedy looking individuals like look up from their card games, from their dice games, from their tank, from their uh, glasses of whiskey and uh, tarantula venom. 
and uh, they look up at you and they see you in the door and it's just like a thousand eyes just like not like a thousand like a hundred eyes just turn and look at you he uh takes it in for a sec and then goes to the bar yeah, the eyes follow you uh, from the doorway all the way to the bar. Uh, you're not a regular around here, obviously. You're not from this part of town, and you're dressed a little nicer than everyone. Um, so you can, you almost feel like they are analyzing and assessing each piece of equipment you're carrying and how much it's worth. Uh, they probably take in the scuffs and uh, signs that they're well-worn and well-used as well. Then. Yeah. Yeah, they would definitely see that you're... Uh, your gun is not mint condition. It's like got like scratches all over it and it's dirty and it's obviously seen used. It's got like the telltale burn signs of like ammunition having been expended. Um, and they, they kind of like eye you um, and decide better than messing with you. And they kind of go back to their games, um, choosing to not mess with a bunch of people in their guns and an obvious brawler among them. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, fucking Jack, he probably has some sort of reputation. Yeah, I I imagine, too, he'd probably also carry a Dead Slinger gun with him. Like, even though he considers himself not affiliated, they, they probably gave him, like, at least a low-ranking, like, model. Yeah, yeah, probably, actually. Yeah, so they would, they would, their eyes would wander to that, and then they'd be like, oh, Martell's, yeah, no, don't deal with those much of these guys, and they'd all just like, kind of go back to their games. The, uh, the barkeeper is this, like, old, uh, large woman. Um, she, we see that her, her arms are just, like, thick. Uh, she's obviously used to dealing with fighters and brawlers and all sorts of troublemakers. And uh, she would kind of look at you as you come in. She like cross these like big, uh, beefy arms. Uh, if she was a Viking, her name would be Helga. And uh, she kind of like looks at you as you guys come in, like kind of eyeing each of you uh, in turn, one by one. Um, just this huge shield maiden of a woman. Even ma'am. We have a Might thirst. Be. Uh, what are you and doing here, would... boys? He uh, he says, uh, we have a thirst uh, for knowledge, he says low, and uh, puts across like uh, like uh, silver or something like that. like Whatever the equivalent of silver is in the setting. I, yeah, I, I don't I, know. I haven't what, figured yeah. out money yet, so it's still like gold, silver, and copper. I haven't figured out the money system yet. Like more, more like how much you would pay for a drink in a nice establishment is what he would put across the table. Do you know what she does? She ignores the money, and she looks at your at your like hip where your canteen of water is sitting. You want that? I get that depending on what information you have. What are you looking for? We're, in for we're interested in uh, who killed the man a few days past. Talking about why? You know anything? Yep. Yeah. He was liked around these parts. Came here pretty often, almost every night. Gambled his life away. Owed me quite a bit of money and a lot of debt. He owed my uh, my employers some money as well. He was uh, he was a frequent frequent customer. Well liked. I've drank with him too. Yeah, uh, he he didn't know when to quit. And no one to stop gambling. But uh, he came here frequently. I know who you're talking about. As for who killed him, uh, and she kind of like starts to think, and she looks at you, and she looks at the big brawler, at Jack, and she looks at Eddie, and you see her like kind of like frown, like cock her head to the side as she's looking at each of you. 
wait a minute. Didn't you guys just come in here? We just got chased halfway across the neighborhood by a mob of ne'er-do-wells and street urchins, so no. No, no, you, you, can you guys... Uh, okay, why are you pulling my leg? I, You went up to talk with Jasper. Just a couple minutes ago. Who's... At, Man, at this point, Jasper? Eddie would... <laughs> Eddie, yeah, I think Eddie would um, sort of shush... Um, August there, because um, I, I like to think, so we established that um, Eddie didn't tell Jack about Jasper, who's the witness, didn't tell him his name. I like to think as well that that's the only thing that he didn't fill August in on. Um, so at the moment, it seems mm -hmm. like uh, of the three of us, only Eddie knows Jasper's name um, and, and the fact that he's the witness. Um, so yeah, he would sort of shush August with a with a finger in the air. Puts it over, puts it over um, his lips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you, no, you no, 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 listening. <laughs> yeah, I figure you um, would like, jump in before he'd be like, "Who's Jasper?" or whatever. And, yeah, uh, you like, can take over. Um, she, she's looking past me. She's like, "Where's your friend? The fourth one." few minutes ago. The hell? I didn't see you guys Just come down the stairs. Today. Well, what happened was Jack here challenged us to uh, a little competition. And, uh, well, long story short, we, we uh, made our way down to the ground from uh, from upstairs. We're just coming back up. Oh, if you don't uh, mind sending us back on through? No, I, yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought you were still upstairs. I didn't even see you come down. No, if you want to go upstairs, no, it's and see with Jasper. Uh, he's up there uh, partaking in the goods, uh, and he she'd kind of like give you this look, like there are illicit things happening upstairs, basically. Like, are you cops? Like, don't say anything, or I'll have to deal with you. Yeah, he, he he'll be waiting on us along with uh, along with our fourth. Oh, all right, don't cause any trouble now. And she'd reach out and uh, snatch the canteen. I'm keeping this though. And she'd like take like a, like a swig from it, and you see like like her eyes just like roll back. She's like, oh, that tastes so good. Yeah, whatever. And he takes the silver back. The okay. leaves the canteen. So you guys head upstairs? Yeah. Yeah, I guess we gotta yeah, head up pretending we know where we're going. <laughs> yeah, you you start heading upstairs and uh you get this like overwhelming uh scent that reaches your nostrils. Uh it's like very, very sweet, um, and yet has kind of like a bitter tang to it at the same time. And uh, you know uh, what this is. I mean, it's it's very common. Uh, it's a, a tactic that Preston uses a lot um, to get people, you know, in and indebted to her. Uh, there's, it's this drug called Scarf. Uh, that's kind of like it's like a it's almost it's almost, almost like a cat, like a marijuana, like essentially uh, in Providence. Uh, you burn it and you like smell it. Uh, you fill a room with the smoke, and it makes like it like like a super powerful hallucinogen. Like it makes you see and feel happy and uh, mouths. yeah you kind of make your way upstairs uh the floor is creaking beneath you and you and you're seeing all the signs of a speakeasy um like you're seeing uh like there's like a guard at the top of the stairs who's kind of dozed off in his chair uh from just the scent in the air from the smoke uh you kind of turn down this hallway and you see that there are like like it's a hallway just lined with doors um lots of them are closed uh and you see that at the very end of the hallway one of them is kind of open. Um, roll me perception checks. Seven. Nineteen. Five. Uh, Nineteen. Uh, you see it's, it's like a kind of a viscous red liquid. And as you kind of move forward, you see that there's uh, like the lantern that's kind of hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it kind of shifts a bit, uh, swaying with the wind. And the light reveals that it's blood. And it's dripping out from beneath the door. 
two. Um, is there like a key uh, keyhole? Yeah, there's a keyhole. He'd look through the keyhole. Yeah, you kind of get down on your knee and like peer through. And what you see is a room just torn apart. Uh, there's like this like stand in the center of the room, this little like pewter rod essentially with like a bowl on the top of it that's smoking. Uh, you see the room is kind of filled with this smoke. Um, not hazy, so you can't see, but you can, you can still see into the room. Um, there are kind of like several chairs and like lounging couches and fainting sofas all, like, all over the place with people uh, lying or sitting on them. But you see as you kind of like look closer that they are like bleeding or dead, um, that they have been slaughtered essentially. Uh, you see that there are like tears in their clothing, um, like the work of like a knife or some sort of sharp weapon. And as you kind of peer into the room, you see uh, two figures uh, shift in the uh, in the haze uh, next to like a, a window. Um, one of them is holding something in its hand and it drops it to the floor. Uh, this person slamming into the ground and kind of like laying, laying there just still. Um, and the two kind of like turn and start whispering to each other. And they, one of them looks over its shoulder towards you and it's Jack. Uh, at that point, I think August would, uh, kick the door down and try to wing the two of them with a shotgun. Yeah, uh, the two immediately, like, look at you, like, surprised, passing with their face briefly, and the second one you see now, clearly, as the door is open, he's turned and looked at you, is you. Oh my god. Can I see this it, shit, too? This is some bullshit. What in the hell is going on? All right, spirit sight. The two look at each other, they look at you, and they turn and jump out of the window. And you're, like, on, like, the third floor. Oh, shit. Uh, um, I spirit run sight. after that. Spirit sight, briefly. Um, spirit sight, you see uh, that these are not a lot. They are not uh, anything you've ever seen before. You see that the spirit is completely integrated into the body. And these creatures. Okay, but there is some kind of like unearthly spirit in them yeah. in their bodies. Yep, something similar to that. What the? Fuck? And the two turn and they so they jump out of the window, no hesitation. And that uh, is right. That's where we're gonna end the session. Damn oh, it! Man. Oh, I run man. to the window and I put the shotgun out. Are they there? Uh, they're they're sprinting away already. They're lupine and graceful in their run. All right, guys. Uh, that was session one. Uh, titled "How It Begins" or "How It Began." Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for playing. Uh, let's do final outro. Uh, Corey, then Dan, then Keel. All right. So uh, I guess in closing, uh, that's some fucked up shit. And uh, I'm sad that Jeff couldn't make it, but he'll be in for the next one. Um, also, you might want to look for like a cheap personal gym. There's usually options in your area. Uh, you know, something like 20, 20 bucks a month or so, they work for you. But uh, that's all. <laughs> yeah, I'll echo that. Don't go to Orange Theory. It's like $160 a month. <laughs> Just uh, look up a, a high-intensity interval training routine online and use that. It's basically the same thing. That's all I got. No plugs. Great wow, game, Tyler. Thank, thanks for that insight, Dan. You are so helpful, Keel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. Crazy. Awesome start to this, uh, to this little campaign. So keen for the next session, and yeah, keen for Jeff to to be along for that one as well. Good luck, man! So much happened this session; it was awesome. Can't wait to see where it goes next. Thanks, Tyler, and thanks, dudes, for playing along with me. Yeah, for sure, my dude. Thanks, guys, for playing. Uh, I'm excited for session two. I'm excited to see how this mini campaign finishes out and how it keeps going. Uh, thanks for playing. Thanks for bringing super solid RP. And uh, as always, I hope you find yourselves and you're going to do with me, Corey, <laughs> on a roll. On a roll. On a roll. <laughs>